Uh, seconded by Art Cole. I'll second that. Thank you. All in favor of moving into open? Thank you. That's carried. Okay, this is the motion before council. This motion uh, is re in regards to, um, for those of you that are just joining us, first of all, I'd like to apologize that we are late starting the open meeting but I would like to read the full uh, resolution. And um, it's, it is a lot lengthy. Um, and this is, whereas broadband limitations restrict the services that rural and northern residents can receive, and whereas the majority of the township of Sutherland does not have good connectivity coverage, which is increasingly challenging to our residents and business community, and whereas broadband is a social and economic driver for all communities, and whereas dealing with the COVID-19 global pandemic crisis has proven that access to high-speed internet will provide better access to healthcare, education, and economic development. And whereas in 2019, the Government of Canada announced its commitment to set a national target in which 95% of Canadian homes and businesses will have access to internet speeds of at least 50, 10 megabits per second by 2026 and 100% by 2030, no matter where they are located in the country. And whereas in 2020, the provincial government has announced that they are investing $150 million in reliable broadband and cellular service to create more economic and educational opportunities in rural, remote, wow. and underserved areas of the province as part of their $315 million initiative called Up to Speed, Ontario's Broadband and Cellular Action Plan. And whereas all residents of this province are equally entitled to efficient and high-speed and affordable internet. And, there, and whereas the need for investment and development of broadband infrastructure is now. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Seguin establish the provision of better and affordable connectivity as a priority for the Township and West Perry Sound area by allocating monies in the two, Township's 2020 budget or directing funds to be used from our reserves up to $350,000, including our modernization funds for connectivity for shovel-ready projects. And further, the Council directs staff to liaise with the federal and provincial governments, pursue any and all funding opportunities, and develop a short-term strategy for project implementation, including sources of funding. And further, that the township representatives continue to liaise with other, the other six West Perry Sound municipalities in the riding of Perry Sound, Muskoka, Area First Nations communities, West Perry Sound Smart, and the Perry Sound Muskoka Community Network to develop terms of reference for collaboration on the basis of connectivity. And further, that the resolution be forwarded to Mr. Scott Aitchison, MP. Perry Sound, Muskoka, Mr. Norm Miller, MPP, Perry Sound, Muskoka, and the following ministers in our federal and provincial governments, and there's a list of several ministers. Could I have a motion from Councillor Cole? I'll so move. And could I have a seconder from Councillor Vincent? I second that. Okay, and uh, Clerk, I'd like to call for a recorded vote on this. Madam Mayor, my hands up. Yes, Councillor Osborne. Thank you. Yes. Uh, just to the clerk through you, Mayor, uh, should a sure. motion to amend, amend be submitted at this point before this vote? Oh, uh, what would be the proposed amendment? 
The proposed amendment would be to amend the commitment of up to $350,000 since we've learned that the total project cost is 557, 50% would be 278,500. So the number is incorrect on the motion. Um, okay, uh, if you want to try, then the addition of Humphrey could not be in there if it's up to. If you want to, I, I would like to, if you want to make it more accurate, that you would amend it to, to 280,000. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I'd move that amendment if I have a second. Is there a second? Is there a second? Okay. Yeah. Is there a seconder for Councillor Osborne's motion or amendment? Sorry. I'll second it. Okay, Gail seconding it. The counter Great. So now, and I have I have a hand up from Count Daryl Mo Councilor Moffat discussion here. So uh, one question, uh, Mayor. I noticed that you did not include, and further that staff be directed to acquire the necessary resources. That's from the a copy from the archipelago. Um, uh, resolution and they are actually hiring a consultant to help them through this and so I don't think we need to do that okay I would I would also like to make a motion to amend that resolution to include that we direct yes, staff just Sorry. a sec the clerk is speaking you have to Sorry. deal with the first Sorry. amendment so okay. okay so so is there any discussion on the first amendment now we take a vote on that so do you do you have the wording first? Okay. The only the only motion is to change the number of three hundred and fifty to two eighty. Is, is that correct, Councillor Osborne? Two hundred. Yes, that's the amended amount. Yes. No further discussion. We need a vote on the proposed amendment. Okay, so we need a vote on the proposed amendment down to two hundred and eighty thousand um, dollars, and I'm comfortable to see a show of hands on this. Is everybody that's in favor of that proposed amendment, then we can entertain Councillor Moffat's amendment. Uh, all in favor of amending it? And I will vote for that. So that's carried. Okay, so it's that's now up to 280,000. Up to 280. Councillor Moffat, your amendment. I would like to propose the staff look at uh, a long-term included in this reviewing a long-term strategy with regards to broadband internet in the township. Okay, so it would be, um, I guess we need some wording. Uh, would you add, that, so be it resolved that? No, and further that, the t that staff be directed I don't know. I like. I would say that we're missing. I'm not sure who staff, what staff is going to do, but we need to have staff develop a long-term strategy with re with regards to broadband in the township of Seguin. Can I can I suggest just one other wording to that? That a broad a long-term broadband strategy in the township of Seguin and the region. So we refer it back to this regional initiative because like roads, communication doesn't stop at the border. Mm -hmm. Mayor? Uh, Councillor? Osborne. Okay. Point, okay. Point, of point of information, Mayor. Just a point of info. I think what Councillor Councillor uh, Moffat is asking for it. It's an amendment that staff further look into the long-term development of a plan. I'm not sure that staff would be able to make recommendations based on region-wide because that's out of their purview. Thank you. Okay. Is that correct, Councillor Moffat? Well, I would, again, we, we reference in another and further liaison with, with the other six men out. So yeah. I, I think that's the best we could do is you know work with but i don't uh, you know i, I don't know that okay. we have internally the capabilities to do what i'm asking okay councillor cole uh, i oh, i was just wondering daryl would you be satisfied if we 
would say something like to complete the rollout within Seguin and further to liaise with other the other municipalities. Well, rollout long-term strategy to cover the township, then right. that, yeah. Okay. Like, okay. It, it, can I try, but I, I've just been taking notes. Can I just try this on you, Councillor Moffat? And further, that staff be directed to develop a long-term broadband strategy for Seguin and coordinate with the regional broadband group. Uh, I could take that. Thank you. Okay, so you're, that's your motion for an amendment? Yes. Uh, yes. Councillor Osborne, you have your hand up or are you seconding it? I'll second that. Okay, so it's moved by Daryl Moffat and seconded by Rod Osborne. Is there any discussion on that amendment? All in favor of that amendment? Okay, so that's carried. I need to write that in, right? Sorry, everybody. Okay, so we have the motion on the floor. We've changed the amount. Oh, sorry, Councillor Osborne. Yep. I'd, I'd like to propose one further amendment there. Okay. That this resolution be deferred until such time as Council is provided with complete information on the proposals. I'll move that. I'll move seconder for that. No seconder? Oh, I'll Councillor, second that. Second. Councillor Collins will second that. Councillor Collins, okay. Yep, I'll second that. Uh, you need to say that again and we need to get the exact wording. Oh, the amendment would be that this resolution, whatever number it is, because I don't have it in front of me, be deferred until such time as we have complete information on the proposals, plural, that were presented uh, through the RFP or our whatever it was. So just a point of process for you. That's not an amendment. You're making a motion to defer. That's right. That's well, a request to defer or a motion, whichever it takes, Clerk. Right, right. So it's not an amendment to the motion. Okay, it's You're a request. Requesting it of the motion. Okay. So we have Councillor Osborne who requested a deferral. The request for deferral is seconded by Ted Collins. Okay. So now council has to vote on whether or not to defer. Okay, do we do it that way or do we do give them three choices when they vote carry no, no. You have to vote they or defer. Vote on not to defer. Okay. So yes, so they'll either vote yes to defer, no not to defer. Okay, let's call let's call a uh, recorded votes on the deferral. He wouldn't be So this is a vote on whether or not to defer the entire resolution.
Councillor Osborne. Yay. Councillor Felder. I think you're muted, Terry. Yay. Councillor Benson? Nay. Councillor Collins? Councillor Collins, your vote? Yay. Councillor Moffat? Yay. Councillor Cole? Nay. Mayor McDermott? Nay. The motion to defer is defeated, so now we will call the vote, the recorded vote on the motion as amended. And I'll just remind council that the two amendments are uh, up to $280,000. And further, that staff be directed to develop a long-term broadband stra strategy for Seguin and coordinate with the regional broadband group. Councillor Collins. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. What? What? That's okay. That's a yay. Councillor Moffat. Councillor Yay. Councillor Cole. Yay. Yeah. Councillor Osborne. Uh, you're um, muted. You're muted, Councillor Osborne. Yay. Councillor Felder. Yay. Yeah. Councillor Finson. Yay. Yay. Mayor McDermott. Yay. I can report that this resolution has passed unanimously. So thank you very, very much, Council. And I think it's a very important first step, but I do agree with the regional strat or township strategy needs to be a priority going forward. So Brian and Liz, you have your work cut out for you. I think you've got a couple things to get back to us on. Um, and uh, in terms of tower locations and um, looking at Humphrey Fiber. So congratulations and let's go forward. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I'm sorry, Councillor Moffat, yes. Sorry. Just thank you. Just before you go, Brian, uh, hopefully you've not noted down some of the questions in terms, I know the mayor mentioned tower locations, but others, hopefully that you can get back to us in a relatively short order, because I think that's going to be important for us to get out to speak to the residents, to let them know uh, on some finer details on this project. Yeah, what I've got down here, and let me know if I'm missing anything, uh, Councillor Moffat. I've got uh, tower locations. We'll look at those. And I, the question I'll throw back is, um, is there somebody on council that you would like us to work with that, hey, what about this area? What about that area? So we're, again, we want to be partners with you guys and, and do what's best. So we're open to working with you on best locations. Um, the yeah, other one the is coverage. The director of planning, Steve Stone, yep. combination with Chris Mahan, who I know you know, our GIS. Fellow, now I just one warning. Chris is going to be on vacation, I believe, next week. So you might want to get that request in real quick. Okay, <laughs> I'll let the I'll let our engineer know. Maybe he wants to have a chat with Chris prior yeah, to that. And I, I I'll mention it. I Chris is going to be at a meeting uh, with our committee, our our group tomorrow morning. I'll mention it to him. Okay, great. And as well, I, I, we're going to look at what it would take to fiber up Humphrey from a tower location and based on. We'll get a rough idea whether we move that tower a little bit. And the other one is, how can we look at more coverage to the east? I think it was also a recommendation from one of the councillors. Um, if I'm missing something, please let me know or send me an email and uh, I'll have that looked at. 
Do we have Brian's contact information, Mayor? You can. No, you can we don't. Uh, well, it's on. It's it's on the proposal, isn't it? On the last page of each proposal. Yeah. Yeah. That is. Yes. Okay. Where'd you go? Okay. Where'd yeah, you thank go? Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank. Thank you, Brian. I will. Okay. Uh, something else. I'll. Fall, I'll send you an email. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks a lot. I was telling. I don't want to keep people off, but we are de behind for our public meeting. Um, Councillor Osborne, is it urgent? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, bad hand. Okay. okay. I'm going to move us on to, we're going to jump on our agenda to the public meeting, which was supposed to start at 530. Um, so the motion is that Council of the Corporation of the Township of Seguin does hereby adjourn the regular meeting to hold a public meeting for the following matters. Zoning bylaw amendment application number R2020-0007-H for Chapnick and the zoning bylaw amendment application number R2020-0005 for a housekeeping update. Could I have a motion by Councillor Osborne? So moved. So moved. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Fellner. Seconded. Thank you. All in favor? Thank you. Here's our little skip that we go through. Council will now hold public meetings for proposed zoning bylaw amendment applications. In accordance with the Planning Act, Council will consider all matters placed before it prior to passing a zoning bylaw. Anyone wishing to receive notice of the passing of a zoning bylaw amendment not owning land within 120 meters of the area to which it applies and who has not submitted such a request in writing should provide your full name and address to the clerk before leaving this meeting. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Seguin, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of Council to the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal, and the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal unless, in the opinion of the Tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. The purpose of Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application Number R2020-0007-H for Set Chapnick is to rezone the subject lands from the existing Limited Service Residential LSR Zone to Limited Service Residential Exception Zone to permit the construction of a 782 square meter sports barn accessory structure requiring the following special zoning exceptions. Number one, permit a sports barn recreational accessory structure containing sport courts, gaming areas, bar area with sink, washrooms, and mechanical and storage areas as permitted accessory building on the property. Permit number two, permit a maximum height increase from the required 4.5 meters to a proposed 9.4 meters for the sports barn. And number three, establish a minimum front yard setback of 150 meters and a minimum shoreline setback of 100 meters for this proposed sports barn. I now ask the clerk to state the method by which the notice of the meeting was provided and the dates on which that notice was provided. Notice of the public meeting was provided by posting the property and by regular mail on June 30th, 2020. Notice was therefore considered to be provided in accordance with the requirements of the Planning Act. Has anyone registered to speak in favor of or in opposition to this application? Jason and Jody Chapnick, the applicants, Greg Corbett, Planscape Inc., an agent, and Chris Madden, Tamarack North, an agent, and Marie Poirier have registered to speak. Has the township received any? Sorry, there, you have to. Oh. You have to recognize them that one by one. Okay, I, I'm going to recognize you on the Zoom. So, Jason and Jordy Chapnick, are you on Zoom? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, Greg Corbett, Planscape. Yes, I'm here, Mary McDermott. Okay, thank you. And Chris Madden from Tamarack. Yeah, right here. And Marie Poirier. Okay, thank you. They speak. Do you, but I'm, they get to speak. Now? Okay. 
Um, so I'll ask um, you to speak in the order in which you're listed here. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Chapnick, can you speak and tell us why we should this? Sure. Um, I guess uh, where I'll start, uh, thank you so much for, for the time. And um, I'd say I'm very excited about the broadband strategy. Uh, great to learn about that while I was waiting. Um, I, I just went to the property uh, today uh, to look around uh, and see exactly where the sports barn is proposed to go. Uh, I've seen a bunch of letters that have come in uh, in opposition that seem to be all kind of the same template that seems to be inspired by our neighbor, um, suggesting concerns about um, uh, the visibility from the lake, and I was we were somewhat uh, surprised and uh, a little bit dumbfounded by these concerns. I went to the property uh, today. I, st I stood right there. I took a video. I understand I can't present that video, but the trees in the area of the proposed sports barn are about you know 80 feet in height. Uh, it's basically forest land, as, as all of you guys know what that's like. It's very, it's very, very dense. Uh, the proposed location is 150 meters back on our property. It's nowhere close to the water. It it's, couldn't be any further away. Uh, and it's 100 meters plus back on the neighbor's side. And, and uh, you know, the, the, but, but the interesting thing is that irrespective of the height that we're asking for, it is completely invisible. So this kind of concept and this concern that it's not going to look good from the lake point of view, it's completely invisible from everybody. The only uh, party that might be able, that will be able to see it is the neighbor. Um, and uh, that just depends on how many trees they, they, they cut down on their property between the sports bar and them. Um, the sports barn is right now. The other thing that's kind of interesting is that almost exactly where we're putting this barn, there was a barn, there is a barn there right now that was constructed about a hundred years ago, it seems, something like that, maybe 80 or 90 years ago. Uh, and it's, it's a similar height. I, I didn't get to measure it, but I think it's 25 plus feet. Um, and, and, and you, you can't, you can't see it. You can't see it from 20 meters over uh, on our driveway. You can't see it when you're standing at the sports barn and looking up, no matter how high it goes, it cannot be seen. When you're standing there, you cannot see the water from there. You can walk 50 meters towards the water, uh, and you're even halfway to the water and you turn around and you cannot see it. So I, I, I can't stress this. Uh, enough. This this proposed structure cannot be seen from the water. Uh, it's just it's it's unless you've got X-ray vision, you can't see it. I've got video of it. I'd welcome anybody to come over. I don't know if you guys do this, where someone just comes and walks by and stands there, because it's completely obvious that we are it, like, for for lack of a better term, in the middle of nowhere and does not affect the lake uh, whatsoever. And I, I'm assuming that is why, um, you know, you, the bylaw indicates 60 meters uh, back where these accessory buildings should go. And because even at 60 meters, you can't see anything. We're at like 150 meters on our property and, and 100 meters on the neighbor. Uh, the, 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 the height of the sports barn, which is the, the, the real exception that we're looking for, is a little bit of a, um, uh, uh, the, it, 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 it's a bit misconceiving because it, it's a tiered roof. So yet the very peak of the roof, even though it kind of looks like, like that gives it the height of this very peak, it's just an extra architectural effect to bring light into the, to the barn from the top. Um, you know, the average, the average uh, from the midpoint um, of all the tiers uh, you know, is about uh, 21 feet, and without the top tier, it'd be about 20 feet. Uh, but, but again, irrespective of whatever the height is, this is not going to be seen by anyone on the lake. 
uh, except for potentially the the neighbors, the Nullmeyer's property. Um, I, I I didn't I we we never uh, expected there to be any issue with the neighbors. We're very sensitive to n- having good relations with the neighbors. Uh, took me a, a while to get in touch with the neighbor. Uh, was not expecting there to be any type of concern whatsoever. But since there was, uh, got in touch. I offered to uh, to add you know any type of landscaping that would kind of help. Uh, you know, any concern that that they'd be able to see from their property. And I also offered to discuss even pushing it back. Let's say we went and said 150 meters, 160 meters uh, uh, back, which would make it even further from the water on their side, which I I think and I hope that they appreciated that we'd be we'd be willing to do that uh, as sort of a compromise. Uh, to just help them. I, I, I don't want them to be upset by this. And again, we were super surprised that they had any concern because of how far back and how buried this building is. Um, and and, uh, and so we were surprised by, by that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, again, I, um, um, I, I, I think that on the other side of the property, I think we've come to the council before uh, we 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 got a severance and we've worked with our other uh, neighbor Mark Schmaltz. Um, you know, he, he I think now, whereas he was concerned about what we would do, we've taken all of his concerns into account. He's super happy with us, and uh, you know, and I and I'm trying to do the same thing here. Uh, it's a little bit hard because it's the the issue is getting a bit obfuscated with. Uh, the popularity of my neighbor and asking all types of people to write letters about their concern from the water. But it's really a red herring issue because you can't see it from the water. You won't be able to see it from the water. It, it's it's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so, again, if, there, if anyone has any concern, I can drive up anytime, drive over and meet right on the property. Maybe there's staff that you guys like to do that, and you'll see the only danger is getting eaten alive in the middle of nowhere. It is just nowhere. So, uh, again, really appreciate, uh, you know, hearing uh, us out on this, and uh, thank you for for your consideration, and I'm here to answer any questions. And, and, and you know, I know that there were some other concerns about you know, light. This is not. This is. This is something that we. we maybe I should just say that one of the main reasons we're we're doing this uh, is because we we love the property. We're spending a lot of time and energy. Uh, you know, developing uh, this property. We spent years with architects and designers and planners. We're not putting. We're we're, we're very uh, conscious of where uh, buildings will go on the property, so it really re- reflects well and doesn't sit too much on the water. We share everyone's concerns about uh, not, you know, cluttering up the the, the visible space. And what we really want to do is build something that we're not just there in the summertime. In fact, we view this as a 12-month uh, place that we want to spend time in. Uh, for the rest of our lives, and we want to uh, we want to we want to really be there 12 months a year. And part of that is having a draw to have activities there 12 months a year. And that's why we're fortunate enough to be able to uh, consider a structure like this, where we can have our own activities like basketball and uh, and pickleball uh, during the winter and in the off months. Uh, and, and, and saw this as a way to do that and to, uh, to do that in a way that isn't going to bother anyone. This isn't, this isn't for anyone else besides uh, us and our family to use. This isn't a sleeping quarters or anything like that. We asked for a sink in there because, uh, you know, running around and doing exercise mostly during the day, uh, people will be sweating and probably want to drink. And the reason it kind of gets high again is because we want to bring natural light in because we want to kind of use it during the day. Any concerns about like kind of light and and us lighting up the whole property with landscape lighting is also not the direction that we're going in. This is just for for us and our family and our friends to get exercise and spend more time uh, during the year, uh, you know, up, up, up in sequence. So we're super excited about it. And this kind of vision that we have this is kind of a key part of it because it will 
draw our kids and, and uh, to come up and spend time with us if there's activities. Otherwise, they say, well, what am I going to do up there? And, uh, and again, we don't want it just to be about, you know, uh, water sports and things. We want it to be about uh, uh, all types of physical activity. So, again, thank you so much for your consideration, and I'm here to answer kind of any questions and uh, hopefully alleviate any concerns. I, I, I'd really like to do that. Okay, thank you. I'm going to let the other agents speak. Um, Councilor, or Greg, do you have, Mr. Corbett, do you have anything to add? Yes, thank you, Mary McNerby. Yeah, just a couple of things, if I may. I think Jason's gone over it quite well, everything, but again, um, I'm sure you all know me. I'm Greg Corbett with Planscape, 104 Kimberly Avenue, Bracebridge, Ontario, Q1L 1Z8. Um, so as is being indicated that the zoning bylaw amendment is required for two purposes. Uh, the one is to permit the two additional uses in the building, and that being the fire area and a washroom. And the second is to permit the, the building height. Um, I would point out that in exchange for this, uh, the bylaw would also become more restrictive on the property in terms of increasing the minimum setback to, as is being indicated, 150 meters from what is currently would be required, and also increasing the, the setback from the shoreline to 100 meters from what is currently required. And finally, it would also restrict the floor area of the building. So in exchange for allowing the two um, amendments that, uh, to, to the bylaw, it would also become more restrictive in other aspects. So I, I know council did receive a copy of my planning analysis that goes over the provincial policy statement and council official plan. So I, I won't go through that. I would maybe just uh, heighten a little bit about what uh, Jason has indicated with terms of the height. So again, the, the height measure I know is on your agenda package in the staff report at page 207. Now I know on the one that was on the website, it didn't come out very well. So, but there is another um, illustration of the elevation on page 217. And as, uh, as Jason indicated, as you'll see there, the building is a tier. So it really has almost three roofs to it. And the, um, in this case, the midpoint is really taken just from the, that third tier, this top tier, which is a relatively small sized roof, um, but it really has a significant impact on how the, how the, um, the height is measured. Um, generally with a height that's being proposed to a midpoint, here it's, um, we're asked for the 9.2 meters. If that was on a normal roof, the straight um, uh, gable roof, you would be looking at a building with a height probably at 50 to 55 feet. But in this case, the peak of of that second or that top tier is approximately 20 feet below that at about between 30 and 35 feet. So it's quite a bit less than what the, the 9.2 midpoint um, measure um, would indicate to it. Um, if we were to actually take it from the, the bottom eave to the peak of the roof, the midpoint of the roof would then be 6.7 meters, which I would uh, point out is the same height that is permitted for a one and a half story boathouse along the shoreline. In this case, this building will be more than 100 meters back from the shoreline uh, at its closest point. In terms of the uses that are being proposed, uh, again, um, your bylaw does define habitable room and it, and it says designed for living, dining, sleeping, kitchen, or washroom. So really, other than the washroom, the building will not have any of these specific uses that are set out. Although we do recognize because there is a sink in the fire area that under the bylaw, it is classified as a kitchen although it won't, won't not um, function as a typical kitchen. It will just strictly be a, uh, a sink area in the bar. Uh, again, as Jason has indicated, there will be no sleeping accommodations whatsoever in the building. And again, as Jason indicated, if I know in other ones, there's concern would it be used as being commercial or anything, but again, it's strictly for the family's use. And again, I think uh, as Jason also indicated, one of the main benefits is that it's pulling a lot of activity away from, from the shoreline and activity would now be on the interior of the property well away from anyone. Uh, we do know that the township has received some submissions with respect to the application, and we do thank staff for forwarding them to us. And we are also forwarded the submission from Ms. Uh, Marie Poirier on behalf of the Null Myers, and we thank her for forwarding that to us prior to tonight's meeting. Um, as Jason has indicated, upon learning of the concerns, uh, uh, the Chapniks did reach out to them and have been able to have some discussions with them. And I also had the opportunity to do some discussions with um, Ms. Poirier. And, and we're confident that we'll hopefully be able to 
to resolve any of the issues to everybody's satisfaction. Um, again, as Jason's indicated, the, the main comments seem to be with regards to the visual impact from the lake. I won't go through, through it all again, uh, but other than to again emphasize that the whole purpose for the increased setbacks that are is in the zoning in the by, in this pilot to the 150 meters from the from the front and 100 meters from the the shoreline on the adjacent property is to ensure that it is located in the area where it will not have a visual impact from the lake and as Jason's saying it will not be seen. It's a really densely heavy. Uh, tree to area and again all of those trees are all would surpass the height of, of the sports barn that's being proposed and again as Jason's indicated there is a building there right now that cannot be seen uh, from from the lake at all um, finally I think in terms of the overall development again um, the, the uh, proposed building will be almost double the setback uh, of the six more than double the setback of 60 meters from from the shoreline which is generally considered the setback after which there will be no or limited impact on the shoreline. And the overall development on the lot is well within the permitted lot coverage that's permitted on this lot. So again, um, we'd be pleased to answer any question that council may have on this. Thank you. Um, Mr. Madden, do you have anything to add? Well, again, thank you for the opportunity of speaking this evening. I think both Jason and Greg have outlined the highlights. I just am really here to speak to the constructability of the buildings. If there's any questions that council may have as to how the building is going to be constructed. Uh, and just because I've been through so many of these applications with the council over the years, you know, I think that this application does really protect the view from the canoe. It is very far back from the water. And, um, you know, we have a uh, we're allowed 5% lot coverage, as it's indicated in the planning report, and the proposed uh, lot coverage of this property is 3.6%. So I think that the Chapmans have taken, it is a very large property, and I think the Chapmans have taken a very, um, you know, it's, it, the buildings are quite uh, extensive to the property, but it's this is what our customers are demanding these days, that we're able to recreate on the properties 12 months a year. And I'm super interested in how a council responds to this. So thank you very much. Okay, and Ms. Poirier, do you have something you'd like to comment on? We have received uh, your letter in our council package. Thank you, Your Worship, and I appreciate the opportunity to address council this evening. Uh, in keeping with my allotted five minutes, I'd just like to highlight for council, please, uh, the concerns that uh, the neighbor has. I represent Kathy Nullmeyer, and the Nullmeyers are directly adjacent to the subject property to the east. Although we appreciate the um, setbacks from the shoreline um, and, and agree that that is certainly a, a mitigating tool to, to impact, this structure, which is in excess of 8,000 square feet and more than the size of the uh, maximum gross floor area for a dwelling, and over twice the permitted height for a um, accessory structure is located 15 feet from the property line of my client. So that poses some impacts to my client, not necessarily to the shoreline. So that's what we were looking um, to bring to the attention of council and to the applicant. And given the size, bulk, and the proposed use of this building for games and entertainment, basketball, bowling, um, we would respectfully request that the structure be moved further to the west, more in the center of the property, to reduce the impacts on my client. Um, we would also request perhaps a further step back, and I, I know Mr. Chapnick has gone to this uh, from the shoreline, um, because although it's 100, um, I believe 150 meters from his, his shoreline, it's only 100 meters from my client's shoreline. So if he builds 20 meters back from that, you're reducing that set back to 80 meters from the structure. Um, although we, we appreciate the gesture to rely on the uh, natural lighting feature um, of the design of this, um, we would hope that perhaps that could be achieved by reducing the height somewhat. Um, it is more than double that's permitted and it's it's a, an extremely large structure um, with an intense use um, and, and an increase in height that 
we, we do believe that my clients and all Myers will be able to see from their property. Um, and I guess the last concern that I had was the actual use of this sports barn, since sports barn isn't defined in the zoning bylaw. Uh, we would like to see some tighter language in the zoning bylaw uh, to limit the use. It, it's kind of the applicant and his agent to say that it won't be used for human habitation. It, I think, would be prudent to have more stringent wording so that future owners of the property that didn't build this with certain intents realize what the permitted uses are. Um, whether or not it's going to be used for human habitation or not, the facilities are there such that it could be. And we would like to see some tighter language um, in the zoning bylaw to limit that. As Mr. Corbett has said to you, um, we've both spoken. I've had a lovely call from Mr. Chapnick as well. And we would like to be able to have the opportunity to get together to try and address some of the concerns that are set out by my client and by way of some of the uh, suggestions that I have made in my correspondence to the municipality. And I hear, I'm here as well to answer any questions on behalf of the Nomeyers and also to um, express our concern and hope that we can uh, reach something that is but a little less impact on, on the neighbor that the Nomeyer is directly adjacent to this lot for such a, a, a large structure, a high structure, and one with an intense use. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone. Um, can I open up the questions? We did correspondence first. Okay. Um, so we'll proceed through this and then we'll ask council for questions. Has the township received any correspondence with respect to this application? Correspondence requesting deferral of a decision has been received from Marie Poirier on behalf of Kathy Nullmeyer, Paul and Don Scott, Bruce and Leigh Smith, Judy and Ron Gage, Peter and Tina Pritchard. Correspondence stating objections have been received from Judy Bronfman and the Lake Joseph North Association. And just to provide a bit of clarification, is my understanding, and Director of Planning and Development Services Steve Stone can confirm this, there is no decision being made tonight by Council. So the request for deferral really is not pertinent at this point. Yeah, this is a public meeting for information only. So um, I think it's prudent that the two parties have agreed to continue talking before it comes back to council for a decision. Do, does council have any questions of any of the delegates? No, there are no further questions. I think you're present. Oh, Councillor Osborne, sorry. My little blue hands there, Mayor. Yeah, you do. I've got so many people, I have to scroll through it. Okay. Sorry. Two questions uh, to Mr. Chapman. How far, what is the setback from the Nolmeyer, is it? Marie, Nolmeyer is your, your, your client? What is the setback of the building to the neighbor's lot line? Um. I, 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 I'm not sure exactly what it is. It's near the lot line, and uh, it's it's a hundred. Uh, it's over a hundred meters from their shoreline. No, I know what it is from the shoreline. Maybe Mr. Corbett could answer how what the separation between the lot line and the building proposed building is, please. Uh, You're muted. Sorry. Yep. There we go. Sorry. Do uh -huh. your worship. Uh, the, it setback, um, it meets the setback requirement. The setback requirement is five meters. It's shown as five meters right now at, at that location. So it's, it is right at the minimum setback then? For, right, that, well, that's what it's, yeah, it's shown at that area right now, yes. Okay, so- And I, as, uh, as being indicated by Mr. Chapnick, if it was to be moved back, it would become further away from that. When, when the building is moved further from the shoreline, it would be further from the neighbor's lot line? That is correct. By how much? Further. By how much? Director? Oh, I'm sorry. We, we haven't done that calculation as of yet. We okay. haven't uh, uh, determined well, exactly how, where we go. I'm thinking this is a consideration for the neighbors uh, uh, <clears throat> that uh, you might want to have a look at that setback. My second question is, uh, through you, Mayor, um, is, uh, is there any possibility that this entertainment center, I call it sports barn, whatever, to me, it sounds like a total recreation center. 
is there any case where this is going to be open to the public other than close friends and family? That's one of my big concerns that it would attract a, a number of interested people and parties. So, uh, so to answer, so that with, with the first question, the other thing is, the other thing that we suggested is, uh, you know, again, this is kind of the middle of nowhere type of land, you know how it is. And the thought was still to soften things for our neighbor, irrespective of the setback would be to plant a whole bunch of trees uh, or, or, or shrubs and do a whole bunch of landscaping to hide the building if if that is what they're concerned about uh, is, is the, 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 the effect. And I think we could have trees. So just be a, uh, uh, you know, kind of a wall of green or what have you um, at the back of their property. And no, there is absolutely zero possibility of this being open to anyone else uh, besides us and our family. Absolutely zero. Not even counselors. Okay, back on this. Uh, uh, you guys, you guys, you guys. I mean, uh, if, we're, if we're all friends now, then that counts, you know. Uh, I'm counts. kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, forget I said that. So, uh, again, the, Ms. Poirier mentioned that there's plenty of land here, and I'm wondering why you would go to the minimum five-meter setback from the neighbor's lot line when there's, like, a lot of acreage here. Was there a reason it had to be that close in plotting that building on this property? You know what? We have spent, you know, uh, an incredible amount of time. We've been working on the designs and placing buildings for uh, like three years now. So uh, it really was part, it's part of a larger landscaping kind of plan uh, about having room uh, and some field in front for, you know, some outdoor play. The, the, the property is pretty historic, and it used to have sort of these elements, right? It had a barn, and it used to have a church on it, and um, and, and there's kind of like a, a little bit of a, uh, a, a field in front. So I think the idea was to keep some of the field and uh, also to, to, to have uh, kind of a bit of an entryway uh, into the front. So okay, well, I think I that was the that, purpose. The reason I asked that, Mr. Chapnick, is that there appears to be a good hundred meters between the carriage house and the sports barn and nothing, no other buildings anywhere in the vicinity, uh, you know, to the other side of the, to the lot, it seems to be wide open. Maybe the terrain's not right. I don't know. It just seems to me that it's uh, pretty, very close to the neighbor's lot line. And that is part of the real problem here. So if, I don't know, if you can yeah. work it with your, with your people, I, I would suggest that you, have a look at relocating the building. Thank you. Yeah, again, I mean, this is all the way at the back of their property. This is the, you know, usually people uh, aren't too concerned about the 100 meters at the back from the water, and uh, they would have their own kind of structures there. And clearly, uh, that would have nothing to do with us as to what they would build and what structures would back on to uh, on onto us. There's 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 not there's not really a view there. And again, whether they're looking at trees, uh, I think we could soften it with trees and what have you. And we have had this discussion about. We started the discussion of where we might be able to move it a bit. The thought was that if we moved it further uh, uh, north then it would it would get further from the water on both sides and uh and 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 that would kind of uh uh adjust and i think it would be a bit further away from the lot line but that hadn't been our main uh kind of uh uh goal in it um but i, I i'm not sure i everything i've heard so far was all about the view from the yeah. lake and and that's not an issue so i'm i'm really not sure what i'm solving for exactly uh, but yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think this, this is a public meeting and I've, I've heard a willingness of the two parties to continue talking and maybe make some, some concessions or changes. Um, so I encourage you to do that before it does come back to council for a decision. So thank you very much for all of your time and your patience as we delayed the public meeting for our internet. But I, I apologize. But thank you for, for being here. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, 
So you can just sign out of the meeting, Mr. and Mrs. Chapnick, Madden, Marie, Thank and you. Mr. Corbett. Okay. Um, Steve, I'm going to ask you to introduce um, the zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, to the rest of Council. So uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Steve. I jumped the gun. I have oh. to read more of the skit. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I didn't know I had to repeat this. <laughs> I thought we did this. The purpose of zoning bylaw amendment application number R two thousand and twenty. Dash 0005 housekeeping amendment is to undertake several wording and schedule changes to provide further functionality to the implementation of the Township of Sequin Zoning Bylaw number 2006 125. The proposed revisions have been prepared by Township staff to address several grammatical inconsistencies and regulatory conflicts. In addition, four site specific map corrections showing the lands to be rezoned from OS to OS1-5 will be undertaken. The housekeeping amendment applies to the geographic township of Seguin and as such, no key map is required. Council and the public should note that staff have identified the current zoning bylaw is lacking in terms of regulation of accommodation units. Staff are encouraging council to align the regulations in section seven of the zoning bylaw more closely, closing closely with more restrictive carrying recreational carrying capacity policies in section B 3.3 of the official plan. I now ask the clerk to state the method by which the notice of the meeting was provided and the dates on which that notice was provided. Notice of the public meeting was published in the North Star and Beacon Star newspapers as well as posted on the township website on June 18, 2020. Notice was therefore considered to provide it in accordance with the requirements of the Planning Act. Has anyone registered to speak in favor of or in opposition to this application? No one has registered to speak in favor of or in op opposition to this application. Has the Township received any correspondence with respect to this application? No correspondence has been received. Does Council have any questions? But I, before we have questions, I'll ask Steve to introduce it and remind us. We did see this last meeting as well. Steve, sorry I gave you an early introduction. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, rest of council. Um, so in essence, if you go to Schedule A of the uh, report, <coughs> I'll just introduce, it's probably three different components to, uh, to the housekeeping. Um, first of all, I'll say the last time we did a consolidation like this was in 2017. And that basically what we're doing here is through consolidating, uh, if council has approved uh, 20 or 30 amendments to the zoning bylaw over a period of two or three years, they won't actually document until a consolidation. So that's what we're hoping to do here. Um, we also uh, as I said, the first component would be mapping errors that we found. So, for example, the, the uh, four schedules that you see are areas in the township that are zoned something that really doesn't, well, doesn't have an actual use associated with it. So the uh, OS is uh, not defined as a, a use activity. And so what we're doing is it, they're basically open space blocks within the existing plans of subdivision and we're changing that OS to uh, an identified use in the schedule that says passive recreational uses are permitted on those open state, uh, uh, space blocks. The next part of the schedule A really goes through the various uh, errors and emissions that we had. Um, and so they're highlighted. Um, in some cases, the, uh, the wording actually is in the wrong place of the bylaw it doesn't fit where it is so that would be the case with the first one as you can see with the second one an and is missing uh, so it reads better um, you go down uh, to the uh, the part with the covered decks uh, we're just trying to uh, revise it to deal with uh, freestanding decks as it relates to uh, areas uh, close to the water within 20 meters uh, we 
uh, refine the uh, 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 construction uses rather than to list all those different types of activities, we just refer to them as a construction trailer or storage. Um, the other thing that we, we did, as you can go through, there's other uh, uh, clarifications that deal with eave overhang that would be on the second page. Um, uh, boat houses, you know, uh, we have called, uh, on occasion call for uh, uh, a boathouse without a slip. So we're just adding that for clarification purposes. And then what, uh, sort of the biggest one that I've been really fearful over the last uh, four or five years is that, uh, and this came out in uh, bold when we were dealing with the De Lorenzo, and that's the, uh, the zoning bylaw is very permissive when it comes to accommodation units uh, in relation to how many meters of frontage uh, commercial property would have. And so I've been, up until now, we've been, uh, uh, very careful with that. And this is our first opportunity to present uh, a fix, a really good fix uh, for council, which ties it back to the recreational carrying capacity policies in the official plan. And if you look at them, uh, the current zoning bylaw will allow for one accommodation unit for every two meters of frontage. And what we're proposing mirrors that of the official plan but it also ties it in nicely to recreational carrying capacity, which is to say, uh, even though the bylaw allows it, you still have to conform to the official plan before you get uh, uh, recreational carrying capacity units. So the way this is worded now, uh, sites like De Lorenzo would know because it's an over capacity lake with regards to recreational carrying capacity, uh, the bylaw would allow them now to get more units what this fix does would prevent that situation from happening. So that's what we're, we're hoping council sees uh, the logic in that. And um, I'm uh, more than welcome to answer any of your questions with regards to the changes here. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, Councilor Osborne, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Good report, Steve. Um, I, I question though why we're doing this now as opposed to once we go through the official plan review, uh, whether this shouldn't be incorporated in, into that, or is there some urgency to do it now? Uh, yes, uh, I would say there's, are you referring to the recreational care and capacity accommodation units discussion? Well, with all of these, all of these uh, housekeeping amendments. Well, well uh, okay. Uh, there is a, if you want to call it a sense of urgency, I would say housekeeping happens on a regular basis with zoning bylaws, as I said, usually to, to fix little things like errors. Um, and that's what you see for uh, the schedule changes in the four maps. They were obviously coded wrong. And what we need to do is change that so that they actually are associated with a, a use that's allowed in the bylaw. The other, other ones that you're seeing are just really clarifications for interpretation so that we can effectively do plans review when we get plans in for developments. The, the real urgent, urgent one is the one with the recreational care and capacity. Yeah. And why council feels comfortable, should feel comfortable with that, it does, uh, it's an ironclad tie in with the official plan now, so. Which would help us on clear the growth issue. That's right. Uh, Okay, no, one, no. one other uh, question here. Uh, under construction uses, under Schedule A to the bylaw, there's a mention of construction trailer or storage containers to incidental to construction. And I, and I realize that it's, that's dealing with construction. My question, I guess, since that subject's brought up, are, are sea cans or shipping containers allowed as a permanent structure on any of our properties? Uh, yes, uh, they yeah. are in certain zones. So our industrial zones, for example, permit them. The airport would permit how, them. How about residential <laughs> LSR? No, not in those zones. Uh, the only sort of residential zone, if you want to call it, would be the rural area. They're allowed out there. Rural. Rural, rural residential. But not no. LSR or... Are, are you? 
Just rural. Rural. Just rural. Because there are a number of containers popping up throughout Seguin. I don't know if the other councillors have seen this. We're talking 25 and 30 foot sea cans, steel. Yes. Uh, they're yeah. popping up everywhere. And I'm wondering, like, how do we deal with this? Yep. Uh, is there any plan to, to deal with this? Is there any bylaws that can eliminate yep. them because they are unsightly? Yes. And the simple answer is yes. We try to, uh, uh, when we're out observing in the in the countryside, if you want to say, and we see something that appears, uh, we try to get in contact with the uh, with the owner and ask them what they're doing, and uh, we confirm zoning as well. And uh, uh, we nicely ask them to comply if they're in a residential zone, for example. We ask them to comply that they're not uh, allowed in 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 a residential neighborhood. Well, and more importantly, what about seasonal residential lakefront? Properties. They're, yeah. popping, yeah. they're popping up all over there too. Okay, just wondered if they were legal. They're not. I That's think it's right. something That's for long term. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. We did have, I was involved in a request to put one in a very residential area and it was denied. So um, you just sometimes do it. people ask, do it. sometimes they don't ask. But um, I think it is, uh, it's not really part of the housekeeping unless it is no. defined as construction. Uh, Related, but I think it's something I know bylaws looking at some of those well, things. Well, it's something we better we, we better look at that in our official plan review too. Maybe make a note of that to outlaw these containers. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Plan or zoning, Councillor Moffat. You have the floor, Councillor Moffat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Steve, with regards to four point one seven. One. Can you help me understand basements were not part of included in the maximum floor space before until you make this change? I'm looking at schedule A on page 233. Yes. So foot, uh, footnotes to table. Uh, uh, yeah, 4.1. So... Uh, and this is something, eventually, when we get into a comprehensive review of the zoning bylaw, uh, this really stems from uh, what is called gross floor area. And mm -hmm. often, if you have a walkout basement, for example, it now results in um, it being factored into the gr gross floor area calculation. If it's a, uh, a below grade basement with no walkout, even even at a tiny little door, for example, pushes it into the gross floor area. So what uh, what this definition does is it um, it brings that nuance of the bylaw dealing with walkout basements and lack of walkout basements into into calculations of the maximum floor area. I uh, uh, a lot of our bigger structures. Uh, cottage wise uh, actually bump up against this because they'll often have one or two, maybe three floors, one with a walkout basement and all of a sudden they're finding themselves. The, the people doing the plans don't factor those into gross floor area, which when we come back to them with, through plans review, uh, really reduces the size of the cottage. And that's really what the intent of the bylaws is. So that's why that's in there, it ties it in. So then just explore this a little bit more. If someone has a current walkout basement, it is possible that their building would be offside based on this change then? Uh, probably not uh, because this change, uh, an, existing, an existing structure, uh, let's say it's uh, on a small lot and it has a walkout basement. It would be, if you want to call it, grandfathered in as a, uh, uh, legal compliant no. non compliant. No. Okay. This really deals with new construction. Okay. The plans okay. review. A lot of these changes are about plans review. Okay. Um, so the other two items, Steve, that uh, it looks like that we are, and, and I asked this in the context of our earlier meeting today on the official plan, it looks like we are adding some new definitions with regards to accommodation units and tourist establishment unit. 
Right. Um, and I guess sort of coming back to Councillor Osborne's comment, why would we not be making this as part of the official plan review change and not have it as part of what is being swept in as housekeeping, given that we're adding new definitions here um, and get it to part of that input instead? Uh, uh, thank you for that question. The, the, the simple answer is, is uh, the analogy I would use is that there is a large opening uh, in the bylaw now to allow people to exploit the number of units, uh, accommodation units on, on the lake. And it's a real, uh, in my opinion, it's a big disconnect with uh, what council expects through recreational care and capacity policies. That being said, we're just adding a definition to a word that's uh, to two words that aren't defined in the bylaw. And in so doing, we're actually tying it in to the uh, tourism establishment definition, which is defined in the bylaw, but is not. Uh, and, and so that definition ties us again further back to uh, the commercial policy section in the OP. So again, I, I, it's like a hole in the dike kind of thing. I'm, I'm trying to put a plug in it before somebody really uh, recognized that, is that it, it came close to being an issue with uh, De Lorenzo. What we did there is a site-specific amendment that uh, curtailed the number of units that they had to existing. But if somebody else had a, uh, 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 a recreational uh, zone property that allowed for tourist establishments, uh, they could easily apply, uh, apply for a number of units. So I'm just trying to uh, shore up uh, what I see as a, a big weakness in the, in the uh, zoning bylaw. That being said, I would imagine that recreational care and capacity policies will probably be examined. I suspect too, given the chatter that we had today, there'll be, <laughs> there'll be some interest to sort of further enhancing, if you want to call it, make it stricter. And if that were the case, we could still approach even further regulations in the zoning bylaw in two or three years when council takes a fresh look, a comprehensive review of the zoning bylaw. So I see it, uh, it's sort of a stopgap approach today. And after the, zone, after the official plan is done, then you can have a, a, a further examination of tying policy, new policies into the zoning bylaw. So when you talk about a stopgap, Steve, you're saying that this gets us to the, across the finish line to the OP. And if we make changes in the OP, you would expect changes here then, potentially. Yes. yes. So, uh, and it's, uh, if uh, council knows, once you amend your official plan, and let's say you do change uh, recreational caring capacity significantly, council then has, uh, is mandated to change similarly in the zoning bylaw within two years of mm -hmm. the new OP. So, and just, just for frame of reference, we're working through the OP now. I don't have my timeline in front of me. Uh, we're expecting, um, I believe it's sometime next year, late next year, That's to uh, to have it, I guess, say blessed by the province. That's right. Well, at least blessed by council. Okay. Uh, and then maybe a six months after that, blessed by the province. So you, yes. we may be looking at early 2022. That's then, right. So what you're trying to do is take this, this change here, plug that um, uh, until early 2022. That's right. Okay. Well, bear in mind, if you start your comprehensive review right after the OP is approved, you know, you're probably looking at another year process. And the experience uh, that Seguin has had over the years is there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of angst with the zoning bylaw review. And, and that tends to go off to LPAT and gets tied up in that, that system for a year or so. Yeah, I guess sort of my overall concern is that we're, and I, and I recognize what you're trying to do, Steve, but I guess given that we're working through the OP review and we said to residents that we're going to go out and consult with them, we're mm -hmm. kind of, you know, uh, saying that, but we're also sort of in the background, we're also making this change without, you know, uh, without input until we continue through OP review. 
and I and I get, have a little bit of concern is that we're making our own decisions, you know, without input and sort of you know. And I under, uh, I'm not I'm not discounting what you're doing, and and I fully understand. But it just you know we're kind of doing stuff kind of in parallel with 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 limited you know limited input. That's all. Okay. Well, yeah, just in response to that, just bear in mind that this was advertised and circulated uh, yep. uh, to a number of uh, interest parties. Um, but I, I can appreciate where you're coming from, uh, Councillor. And as I said, I, I, I've been fearful of this particular regulation or lack thereof for the last four years. I've been pretty crafty in making sure it's not exploit, exploited. I just uh, was feeling this would be the perfect time to uh, sort of uh, put put the wedge in the uh, dike, so to speak, to avoid any further exposure. But certainly if uh, council feels um, that it's too big of a uh, regulation change at this time, we can certainly delete it uh, at, if you direct us accordingly. And just for clarification, what are we doing with this housekeeping here tonight? It's, it's a public meeting actually. So, uh, yes, we're not like, making a decision. Yes. We're not making is it? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your but, time, Steve. But I would say you certainly can direct staff yep. as a re result of your questions to move in a certain direction and we'll, we'll do that. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Felder. Thank you for your uh, patience. Th uh, thank you, mayor. I think I'm off mute. Am I? Okay. Let me, yep. I'll get my hand up. Okay, I got my hand out of the way too, I hope. Steve. Yes. I've got to say that I have somewhat the same concerns as what you heard, where some of these things I believe are probably too much of a stretch to call just housekeeping. And, you know, we did go to the public and said, you know, this is the term where we're going to we're going to do our OP review. We're going to hire a consultant. We're going to consult with the public. We, you know, and we really want everybody's input. And I don't have a problem with, you know, the ones that are indeed minor and housekeeping, you know, clerical error, uh, whatever. But the ones that are, are a bit more than just plain housekeeping, I, I do have a problem. I, I, I don't think, think I, I think if we go ahead with this, we, we're really turning back on what we we stated earlier on in, in, in this tenure. Um, I did have a question and a couple things. Again, I'm, I'm a little bit confused on that basement thing as well, um, but I wanted, in the boathouse section. So every boathouse shall have a minimum of one boat slip. Is that, is that uh, a problem? Are, we, are you getting permits for people who want boathouses with no slips? Yes, we've had, we've had that on uh, several occasions, yes. Okay, so I talked to a guy just last week that he has an existing two slip boathouse on a 200 foot lot and mm -hmm. it's not a it's not a story and a half one it's just like a boat garage and right. i think he was right. looking into replacing it because it's old right and he right. Just said he told me that he wasn't allowed to have two slips he was only allowed to have one but the one slip could be as wide as two combined does that make sense that, to you that uh, didn't make a lot of sense to me but no well I mean, I would, I would again look, uh, look at it from a perspective of is it, how old is it? If it's before the bylaw, then then I would approach it more on a, a non-complying situation. And you're always allowed to reconstruct uh, non-complying situations uh, as long as it meets yeah. meets in essence what was there. Now I can't say if he was enlarging it in any way. I just don't know the, the history on on the inquiry. But no, I, can, I, I just. Yeah, no, it, it, it was built in 89, so it's, it's yeah, so right for the bylaw, but in the, and he did say he was going to change it from a peak roof to a flat yeah. roof, but I, I, I just didn't understand that. Um, 
Uh, so do we allow boat houses now with one slip for boats and then the other area for um, storage? Well, usually they're all combined within, uh, you know, the, the mass of the structure. So yes, we have had situations where people have applied for one slip and there's a, sto a storage associated with it. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, as far as the minor, minor stuff, I, I don't have an issue. I think the ones, I think there's a couple in here that I, I'd be uncomfortable. Right. Well, as, I, I, as minor housekeeping. Sure. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, uh, can I suggest that the one. That's my that, comment, anyhow. For, yeah, for can what, I suggest for. that counselors that are concerned about specific things get in touch with Director Stone between now and when it does come before a resolution, so he understands which ones you're talking about. Um, that was kind of the okay. goal of bringing it forward. And so I encourage you to do that when we're not actually sitting in a council meeting and okay. talk about- And time, time frame to bring this back, Mayor? Um, the time Steve, frame to bring this bring it back to resolution. I'm always optimistic. You could have it back to your next, next meeting if you like. <laughs> I mean, if we could get it done by next meeting, and all it means is that the, the, the issues that you're concerned about, please speak directly to Dir Director Stone, and he can either add them or keep them in and try and convince us before we have a resolution. But it's, we're in a public consultation right now. Okay, fair. okay. that's fair. That's fair. Okay, um, th thank you. Council will now close the public meeting and reconvene the regular meeting. Chris Madden. Uh, Join the meeting. What just happened? Get somebody Who is? Oh. It, it uh, said Chris Madden. Join the meeting. That's done that a couple times. That's the guy from Tamarack. It doesn't matter. We're in public meeting. It doesn't matter. No. That the public meeting held for the following matters is hereby closed and the regular meeting is hereby reconvened. Zoning bylaw amendment application R 2020 0007 H for Chapnick and zoning bylaw amendment application R 2020 0005 housekeeping update. Could I have a motion from Councillor Felder? Uh, so moved. Seconded by Councillor Collins. I'll second that. Thank you. All in favor of closing the public? Thank you. Okay, we're going to go backwards to the account on page 22 of... Excuse me, Mayor. Yeah. Uh, we have about a two-minute recess since we've been going about three hours and 20 minutes. I don't, I'm not counting minutes. But... Do I have that permission, Mr. Clerk? Okay. Two Thank minutes. You. Back Thank quickly, you. please. Thank you. Come on, Sorry. come on. Oh, I
you hurt. We've got the same size bladder, Terry. <laughs> we must. <laughs> Lord. I should be getting more to sell. But Okay, we're going to call this meeting back to order and go to item 6 of page 22 of the agenda package. And that is, I have a motion that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Seguin does hereby approve the accounts in the amount of $1,117,642.88. Could I have a motion by Councillor Finson? I so move. Seconded by uh, Councillor Moffat. I'll second that. All in favor of approving the account. Is there any discussion? First time I've read a motion. Okay, we're going to staff reports here. Do I need to read it all or just the talk? Okay. But the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Seguin does hereby receive the staff, staff reports as presented on the agenda for the July 20th, 2020 meeting of Council. And you have that list under item 7. Could I have a motion by Councillor Cole? Also move. Thank you. Uh, seconded by Councillor Osborne. Seconded. Thank you. And all in favor of receiving the staff report. Thank you. Um, do you want to lead this discussion? On, oh, Michelle, the CAO is going to lead it on the follow-up to the Bell Chamber report. Thank you very much. Oh. 
you're welcome. Uh, this is what was directed by Council at the last meeting. It's just the follow-up to all the recommendations in the Bell Chamber report. Um, some of the items are for information. Other items are where staff will endeavor to implement a number of his recommendations. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory if anybody has any questions. I appreciate you going through it so quickly. Um, and this mayor will try and adopt to all of his recommendations as well, and I'm counting on the CAO and the clerk to keep me pointed in the right direction. I think it was useful to have him comment on our meetings. Does anybody have any questions? It's very self-explanatory, I think. Oh, Council, I'm sorry. I have to keep scrolling. Sorry. Councilor Moffat first, and then Councilor Osborne. So I just have uh, four items. Um, the, the issue about closed minutes, um, I actually prefer the option that uh, Mr. Bell Chamber had uh, put forward. And what I, with the, you know, the issue about, you know, not having or having a time frame, why wouldn't we just have a closed meeting just to accept those minutes and then that was it, you'd be in and out of that closed meeting and uh, adopted those minutes in the event that there wasn't a closed meeting, um, the next meeting. Just a thought. Um, A10, am I correct? Notion of motion? Is that, is that, I'm, I'm trying to understand what notion of motion means on page 44, item reference A-10. <laughs> <laughs> Notice of motion. Ah, autocorrect. There we go. Okay. okay. All right. Notice, notice. <laughs> it should say notice of motion. Okay. okay. Um, on the uh, the idea of the sole source, I actually prefer what was recommended by Mr. Bell Chamber, uh, whereby staff uh, it gets approval in advance of sole searching, sole sourcing. Um, prior to actually soul searching. So, and then the last one I had was on the finance committee. And uh, I'm just wondering, uh, Michelle, is this a, uh, given we had a, a bit of banter and discussion on that, are we looking to maybe amend or are we gonna run the course with regards to the finance committee in terms of their terms of reference right now? What was your, um, what was your thought on that? That's strictly up to council. Madam Mayor, what are we? I think since we've given the current finance committee two very specific assignments, and we're, we've got one of those back actually, but we're kind of waiting for a new CAO to go through their recommendation. Um, I think we should stick with their term of four years um, because we'd have to advertise, we'd have to do a whole thing. So let's stick with what we've got and then look before uh, we have to reconstitute a committee of, of really digging into Nigel's recommendation and, and see, I mean, there's some people that say we don't need a finance committee. There's other people that say we more depth in it. So I, my personal feeling would be let's stick with what we've got right now um, for the two more years. I, I would agree, but I think the one thing that uh, I think it would be beneficial is that someone on council may, similar to what Michelle does, participate and at least listen to you know, the, and again, being an ex-member of the finance committee, the one thing that was frustrating was that we didn't think council was, you know, was, was necessary, like in a sense, overall decision-making was made and we didn't think council, you know, uh, really listened. And that was, that was, a, you know, a bit of a challenge. And obviously we have three members on council now that have sat on the finance committee. So I, you know, I, I would, I, I would be open to, you know, participating in the finance committee you know, discussions, not to amend the terms of, of reference, I agree with that, but certainly to, you know, where where needed or where asked or whatever, but not on a, you know, I think that would lend some, I think some bridge with Mr. Chamber, Mr. Bell Chamber's comments. That's all. Okay, let's, let's consider it. I, I, I did see an, an occasion in the fall when they tried to tackle one of the assignments and in fairness, one of our admin support people just felt overwhelmed because she didn't know the municipal accounting and she was being called on to answer those questions and it put her in a difficult position. So I think 
there is some merit in, in bridging to what we have to do from a, a Municipal Act point of view and the accounting to where the lay finance people are coming from. So we can look at that as we go into budget, Michelle, particularly as we go into budget. When can they comment? How can they comment? Maybe somebody from finance could assist as a liaison. Councillor Osborne. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Uh, uh, Sorry, Councillor Osborne, I, just, I, I think it's important that we do have public input and public review. I think that's important. And I, I wouldn't want to lose that um, oversight, if you want to call it oversight or input. Thanks. Okay, okay. Councillor Osborne. Okay, thank you. There's, uh, I got mixed, uh, mixed feelings on this uh, report and the recommendations. Uh, the closed meetings, I think, is a, it's a minor issue. We've dealt with in the past whether we have a special quick close when there isn't normally one or not uh, is a possible thing. I don't think it's a big deal. Uh, number two, the uh, business additions on the agenda. Uh, I think he's referring to um, uh, addendums. Somewhere in here he talks about addend adding addendums um, uh, and that the fact that there should be for better notice of that. I, I think what we're doing now, it work, works pretty well. I don't recall any addendums that have been put on, have been questioned as to notice because they're typically out there before our meeting. Um, uh, in terms of resolutions for all of our direction, there's a number of times we'll give direction like we just did to Steve about bringing back a report uh, again in a week or in two weeks at another meeting where you don't really need resolutions. I don't think we, we need to go that much by the letter of the law. And lastly, and the, the recommendations on the Finance Committee, finance. I'm still of the opinion that the majority of that committee needs to be ratepayers rate and ratepayers with experience. experience. Um, I agree there should be a councillor or two or the mayor and a councillor on that committee and possibly Michelle on that committee. But to make it majority council on the finance committee, that just that flies in the face flies. of what it's there for. So I'm, I'm against that recommendation 100%. Thanks, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? Okay, well, I really appreciate staff going through them and I think um, there's some next steps and some learning as we go forward. So thank you and we'll try and follow it. Um, I believe, there's no next steps. I think you've you've said which ones you're going to act on, and uh, the others will just kind of park for now. So, yeah. and I I completely agree that there are times we don't need a resolution. Like who's going to a convention? Who cares? Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have too many resolutions. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Director Stone, on the update on the building permit activity to lead into it and introduce it to us. Thank you, Madam Mayor, to the rest of council. So this is the second quarterly report. Um, highlights are our permit activity is down from last year, but our permit revenues are up. And that's due to cost of construction being up. And it's, uh, as simply put, there's bigger, bigger, uh, bigger cottages and dwellings this year. Uh, so that's uh, reflecting, uh, we're almost on par with our uh, revenue stream from last year, just slightly behind a bit. Uh, you'll notice uh, that uh, shows itself in a couple of charts at the back. Uh, you'll also note that, uh, again, a pattern is we don't get many uh, surveys returned on our application process, but our building, uh, <coughs> sorry, our building examination process um, uh, does have uh, 18 uh, surveys that are submitted. So uh, with that, I'd be happy for any questions if there are any. Um, Councillor Fellner. That's not COVID, is it, Steve? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Councillor Fellner, you're still muted. So thank you, Madam Mayor. So Steve, um, I commented on this report a little while ago. It's, I mean, it's 
the first part of it is great, you know. Right. And the, the but what I what I really like to see in this report is where where we figure our service misses are and how do we fix them. Sure. Um, okay. You know what I mean? Like I think I think to your point, like a you know a chart with three survey based on three surveys. Is, so do we really need like so why do we only have three back? Like what can we do to get a better feel of what people actually think about our service levels? I mean, right. we only hear a really we hear the odd good news story and we hear you know a few bad news stories, but it's it's sort of from here, there, and everywhere, you know. So you think going out to a, a third party consultant or, you know, I'd like to get your sort of ideas on how we can do that. And, and you know, how do we hone in on that, that, that smaller fraction of stuff that just doesn't get resolved in a timely manner? What, what, what kind of things do we have to do maybe to, to improve our service levels there? I think then we'd have a more beneficial report. And I'd really like to see the chief building of official pre present it to us, you know? Sure. Yep. So we have a, a chance to, you know, to gauge the pulses of things, you know, yeah, a pretty pretty good. things. I mean, he's yeah. the one, he's the frontline guy, right? So I think that's important too. Okay. So if uh, you could take that into consideration maybe. Will do. And I think it was Councillor Coles that did uh, suggest a third party uh, uh, surveyor. And uh, we just haven't looked into that at this point. I think uh, uh, we certainly can do that and see what the bu budget implications are and understand it shouldn't be uh, a costly exercise, but we can certainly look into that. And yes, I'll bring, uh, I'll make sure Mark is available at the next quarterly meeting. As a matter of fact, he'll, uh, I mean, uh, next uh, next meeting of council, he'll be in attendance. So. Okay. Thank you. I think, you know, going, we're, we're not all that far away from budget season, and, and my experience is some third party, even telephone um, surveys after the fact, can be quite inexpensive, and you can get 100 phone calls made in a day with a third party um, very easily, and you can even do um, uh, robocall interviews. Um, which are very inexpensive, very, very inexpensive to get survey information. So I think it's worth worth looking into. Um, Councillor Moffat. I was just going to add, I thought you may have said survey doodle or something, you know, something electronic that people are able to do. You know, again, I, I think it's an option, but, you know, I, I don't see us spending time on the phone. I think someone would be able to, if we could, maybe through a third party, uh, do some sort of electronic one. I don't know. That's yeah. Well, I think when you look into the option, the, the one thing yeah. about the electronic, yeah. I know not all the builders and certainly not all the subcontractors walk around with iPads. A lot of them are still um, submitting things in paper, so we need to be cautious that we don't miss those ones. No, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that. But the fact is that we're only getting the bare, the barest of minimal amount of surveys returned. So if there's if there's an app that could be developed that would go on a phone that would be able to to provide that information, you know, yeah. let's let's be innovative, let's be creative, let's move forward. And let's look at what, what's already out there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. I think that's all the questions on that one. And over to you again, Director Stone on um, the report on the Gaskin application for the another entertainment pavilion. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor to Council. Uh, the clerk will, will uh, chime in about uh, there's a matter on the addendum package related to this. Uh, the public meeting was held last uh, meeting of Council and there was a lot of discussion on on the location of the building and the proposed setback of 84 millimeters. You'll remember that the um, agent asked for a 70, I think it was a 74 meter setback. And then he has subsequently sent a letter to council, uh, I believe to the, this morning, asking for a 66 meter setback. And uh, 
in discussions with the agent, they simply have gone out and done survey work and they think the best location is at the 66 meter. Um, and so they're asking for council to consider that uh, change in the application as a minor change to it and therefore uh, no recirculation or notice, re-notice of a public meeting required. So it's, uh, the report is, uh, was authored before this request was, uh, came in. So the recommendation is based on the dialogue that Colton had with council at the public meeting and is reflected, uh, reflected in the report recommendation. So thank you very much. Okay, a couple questions, Councillor Moffat. I guess, Steve, the question I have is we've named this one an entertainment pavilion. We've named the other one a sports barn. Can we not multi-use, you know, multi-use facility? Like, it seems that we're creating new names for each one of these. And this, and, and you may be aware, you're probably aware, maybe there's another two or three sitting on your desk and we've got a new name for those ones as well. And I'm just wondering if there's, if, if we can, somewhat standardize what we call them um, that would that sort of encompass, right. you know, I, I, I understand the why we call them what they are, but I'm just wondering if multi-use or something. Yeah, well, I mean, in the simplest term, they are an accessory bill. And right. that's right. <laughs> that is defined right. in the Bible already. Right. I like to keep, uh, keep it simple where we can, but uh, I guess agents like to have fancy names, but it, uh, rendering it down to what it is, it's just an accessory building. So, could, could we not just name it as such then and, and define it for the purpose of the report? Like, just leave it as accessory building? Uh, just certainly. Yeah, certainly. You can. I think also, too, if you, uh, what we can do with applicants is they really want a special term, they can actually define it. That's what we're trying to do uh, as much as we can. And it shows uh, it should show up in the site specific uh, section of the bylaw. So um, it it just seems like we're going to a lot of extra work to start to define everyone that comes in the door that are just just not the generic accessory building. Yeah. So no, I, I agree, and I I prefer keeping it simple to yeah terms that we already know are in the bylaws. Right. Because what I what I fear is that people are going to try to fit a um, recreational trail as a driveway. <laughs> thank you, oh. Councillor. Um, thank you. Uh, before, I, before I go to OLG for a gaming license, am I muted? Am I, if I, no, no, sir, I the director's phone has something to add. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, to Daryl's point, just to finish up on that, if you look at the actual bylaw in Schedule B, Column 2 will define what, what an entertainment pavilion is. So in essence, they can have gaming areas, media areas, fitness studio, wine cellar, one bar with one sink, a dishwasher, and a mechanical storage area. So it's a glorified accessory building, though, with those little things in it. <laughs> okay, Thank you. Are on. Okay, the floor. so I guess... Calling down in Jonesville and Lake Joseph to call it an accessory building would be an insult because that would take away the Jones effect. They all want their own name special. Um, it says here with a gaming area, who's to say they're not having illegal poker going on in there? Like, I mean, should OLG be, should the, should the ministry not be contacted on these places? It could be like bootlegging and illegal gaming going on. Anyway. My question is, it says here this one's going to have a comp like accommodation. Habitation in a guest cabin. So right. does that mean they want habit? Yeah. Permit habitable accessory. Are they going to habitate this one with a bedroom after the games are over? No, Count, sorry, Councillor Osborne. What page could you help us with? What page you're referring to? Sorry, Madam Mayor. Page one, uh, page 67. First page of the report. Yeah, this is the yeah, this is the report Bottom, from February. Is that yeah. only a, 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 a explanation, Steve? Per, permit habitable accessory, habitable. Yeah, if you if you look at the next page. 
uh, talks about permitted habitable accessory structure with with a, a games area. So it's the nuance in the in the uh, bylaw that as soon as you okay. have a bathroom, it becomes a habitable space. So it's habitable, but not not a sleeping quarters. Okay. No, so it's uh, it's very specific to the, these types of uses. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Feller. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to comment on the uh, on the building envelope. I think what the all I what really want to do is the ability to rotate the building a bit to, to alleviate uh, some bedrock. And uh, I know the property fairly well. It doesn't impact the visibility from the shore at all. So I don't particularly have any problem with that at all. Um, just a question. The resolution currently has how many feet in it? So that's a good question. Council has a report with a recommendation from staff, staff, and that's what's prepared. So council will vote on those. The difference being that, keep in mind, the director of planning development services has mentioned the addendum, where there's been a request for change. So you, you can verify this with the director of planning development, but you will vote on. No further notice required because it's minor, which has which was the recommendation in the report, then you'll vote on that. If you choose to go with the request of the applicant's agents that was submitted in the addendum, then the Director of Planning Development Services will tell you the process that will be required to do that, but I don't believe that can be done at this meeting. Okay. Is that correct, Director Stone? Uh, if I may, Madam Mayor, you still have the option okay. to consider everything as minor, even with the the new request for 66 meters. So um, it's safe to say that uh, from a staff perspective, we really haven't had uh, the opportunity to review what's being uh, suggested now. It's uh, a deviation from 75 meters simply because of the lateness of the request. Now, further to Councillor uh, Fellner's comments, uh, you know, if, if uh, Council feels the a change in 11 meters is still minor. You can actually approve it based on the latest submission. So it would be minor. If you ch if you don't think it's minor, you have two options again. Go back to the recommendation, which is 75, and uh, the resolution would say it's minor, no new no notice. Or you can say, nope, we don't we don't want to approve any of this. We think it should go back to the public for another circulation. Then we would bring that back uh, sometime in August and it'll take a, a month or two before they get their approval. Just a question, does it have to go all the way back to the public or could it just go back to staff for a relook at what 66 meters is? Uh, well, you can, yeah, you can yeah. certainly per consider per. of the application um, until staff has had a chance to do another site inspection. Yes, that's, that's an option as well. That would make four, four options. Okay, all right, Councillor Felder? Yeah, Steve, if it, your the whole thing is is subject to site plan and site plan approval by you by you anyhow, right? That is correct. So whatever the final placement of the building is going to be is is subject to your approval. That, that is correct. correct. Yeah. That so I mean, I think the checks yeah. and bounds are there to do this, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So give me the motion. <laughs> these are based on the staff report recommendation. Yeah, so recommend the, these are based on the 75 meters that the staff report was based on. So we have a motion that as per the authority granted under section 34 bracket 17 of the Planning Act, RSO 1990 chapter P13 as amended, the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Seguin has determined the changes to the proposed bylaw number 2020-064 for rezoning application number R2020-0004-H for Gaskin, as indicated, does not require further notice to be provided. Could I have a motion from Councillor Fellner? Uh, so moved. And a seconder from Councillor Collins. I'll second that. And 
there any discussion on that? All in favor? Carry. That's carried. Okay, so now, now that it, we've determined that it's by minor, we will now vote on the actual bylaw. And again, this is based on the staff report prior to the addendum. That bylaw number 2020-064, being a bylaw to amend Township of Seguin zoning bylaw number 2006, dash 125, property roll number 4903-010-006-09530, application number R2020-0004-H at 45 Trails N, Gaskin is hereby deemed to have been read a first, second, and third time and passed by council. Could I have a motion by Councillor Finson? I so move. Thank you. And a seconder from Councillor Moffat. I'll second that. Is there any discussion on this? Uh, Councillor Felder. Uh, no, no, sorry, Mayor, that's uh, an old hand. Okay. <laughs> okay, no, no questions. Um, all in favor of passing it? And that's carried. Okay, um, Steve, I think you're still on deck here oh for God. the Garner application, the creation of a new lot. Do you want to take us through this one? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, to the rest of Council. This. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to read my motion first. Sorry, I'm out of line. Move that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Seguin does hereby grant provisional approval to consent application B 2020-0012-H for Gardner, subject to the conditions set out in the decision. Could I have a motion uh, from Councillor Cole? Also move. And seconded by Rod Osborne. Seconded. Thank you. Okay, now, Steve, please dis please introduce it, and then we'll have council discussion. My apologies, I'm learning. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor, to the rest of council. This application is to create a new rural residential lot on Clear Lake Road. Uh, council had the uh, pleasure of uh, seeing this at the public meeting that was held at, at the last meeting of council. Uh, just for council's benefit, it is undersized in terms of frontage um, and under area as well. Uh, but uh, there were no comments uh, uh, negative to the undersized lot. The, the, the explanation behind it uh, was that the applicants felt that they could uh, have more of an affordable situation with a smaller lot and a house on that lot. So. Uh, with that, uh, staff are recommending approval. There, there is um, uh, the standard set of conditions with regards to that, uh, which are found in the first part of the recommendation. And then you'll note also uh, uh, there's a requirement, or at least a recommendation to amend the zoning bylaw to reflect the site specific size and frontage of this lot. So uh, with that, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so, Steve, again, I'm going to uh, go back to our earlier discussions this morning on the OP review, where right. uh, the discussion sort of centered around, you know, having a smaller lot but having an issue with septic and well. And I recognize in uh, item number seven that we do have in here written confirmation. Um, in the event that North Bay Mattawa come back and said you cannot put a septic in because it's too close to the well or too close to the property line or not big enough of a property, mm -hmm. that what we do tonight just reverses that and we're, you know, they would have to reset the, you know, their, their ask. Am I correct that, to take that? Right. Yes. Uh, yeah, that condition wouldn't be satisfied theoretically and yeah. they to uh, amend the application to make it a larger lot. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Osborne. 
Yeah, so Steve, are, you're suggesting that if North Bay Mattawa did not approve the conditions, they could overrule our decision tonight? Well, it would just mean that condition could not be satisfied. Well, therefore, the lot severance would not be permitted. That's right. Okay. It doesn't hurt for us to take a shot at it based on your recommendations. No. no. And as a has approved under site lots before. Thank you. Uh, no further questions. Um, can I call for a vote? All in favor of letting this go through. Okay, that's carried. Thank you, Council. And this is Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think I have to stay around. I'll be. I'll be I've what? got we've got the zoning application on this same piece of property. So move that bylaw number 2020-065, being a bylaw to amend the Township of Seguin zoning bylaw number 2006-125, property roll number 4903-010-007-02110, application number R2020-006H for Gardner at 22 Clear Lake Road, is hereby deemed to have been read a first second and third time and passed by council. Could I have a motion by Councillor Fellner? Yes, so move. Didn't we already vote on this, Mayor? No, you voted on letting it go through the, the uh, subdivision of the lot, but now we have to do the zoning of the same lot. Oh, that was the severance, this is zoning. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, and I need a seconder from Councillor Collins. Yes. 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 Uh, Mayor. Uh, all in favor of letting of changing the zoning. Councilor Collins, do you have a vote? Okay. Thank you. And that's carried. Okay, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to read this motion, and then I will ask um, Director Coppich to speak to it. That bylaw number 2020-073, being a bylaw to authorize the execution of an agreement between Her Majesty the Queen in right of the province of Ontario, represented by the Minister of Transportation for the province of Ontario, the Ministry, and the Corporation of the Township of Seguin, the Township, for the design and reconstruction of the Humphrey Public School parking lot that will also include drainage improvements along King's Highway 141, which highway is adjacent to the Humphrey Public School, the municipal office, and intersects Humphrey Drive in the Township of Seguin, is hereby deemed to have been read first, second, and third time and count, passed by Council. Could I have a motion from Councillor Finson? I so move. And a seconder from Councillor um, Moffat. I'll second that. Thank you. Um, and Peter, Director Coppich, could you explain it a little bit to us and introduce it? Uh, sure. It's uh, pretty well laid out in this report. Um, the, the school board has been trying to fix a parking lot next door for the longest time, for actually three years now. And every year there's been some kind of uh, holdup in the budgeting process or whatever. Um, the, the main goal of this, this uh, report here outlines the fact that the MTO uh, requires to do some drainage along the, the highway from in front of the school right through in front of the municipal office here. <clears throat> and uh, basically what's happened is uh, without the, the township the Ministry of Transportation uh, would only do, only allow the township to work on this property um, if there's a cost sharing agreement. In other words, the way this is working, we have the school board has a contractor that's going to do the work on the parking lot. And they've also awarded uh, as a contract to do the drainage along the side of the highway. In order for the drainage uh, 
to go somewhere, we have to do a culvert underneath Humphrey Drive and across the front of the municipal uh, property. <clears throat> the MTO uh, would not be able to get a contractor to do this in time. And so they've agreed to go into a cost sharing agreement or proposing a cost sharing agreement with the township. And this uh, report outlines what that cost sharing agreement is. They won't do a cost sharing agreement with the public school. They can only do it with the municipality. And so the goal of this, the goal of this is to get the school board running so they can get their project finished and the township will provide uh, the ditching and the culvert uh, to uh, along the uh, highway right away. So um, the, the contract, really there is no cost to the township. Um, the township, uh, the MTO is currently reviewing this document and um, we, there's been an estimated cost of $80,000 that is the cost of the work in front of the school board and, and the cost of the work in front of the municipal office. And if they approve it, there's no cost to the township at all. And uh, the MTO will pay $80,000 for this, for the ditching work that's done in front of the school and the township. Thank you. Uh, and I, I'll just take, just to add a little bit, I've had about three calls already. Why isn't this work being done when there's no kids in the school? <laughs> the MTO has been horrible to work with. It's just taken forever. Um, there's so many, it's, it's just, it's just not going anywhere. And COVID didn't help again this year either, because everybody's not working in the office. And so anyway, we're at a point right now where the MTO is, is reviewing this, this cost sharing agreement. And uh, there's actually, uh, the tender has been awarded next door and uh, they're actually having a pre-construction meeting next week. So all the hopes are that we can get this project, they can get this project going and the township can provide an outlet for the drainage works that they're doing on that property. Uh, by getting this cost sharing agreement with the MTO. Okay, we have several questions. Councillor Fellner. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Peter, believe yeah. it or not, I understand exactly what you're saying and good for you taking this on and helping them out. Because uh, uh, without that, it could sit there another couple of years. So, Thank you very uh, much. I think it was a great admission. Yeah. Um, Councillor Osborne. Thank you. Peter, could yes. you please explain to me what the hell is going on there? It's in my ward and I don't have a clue. I saw, all I saw was a clear cut, which astonished the neighbors when they ripped every tree out. Uh, is there a plan that we could see visually of what the new entrance and exit to the school parking lot would be? Is the parking lot, the wide whole frontage of the school parking lot being closed off? Is there an exit to Humphrey Drive? Um, all of these questions, and when they pull all these stumps out, they're gonna have basically a farmer's field because most of those stumps are gonna be huge. It's all gonna be soft ground. I, I'm thinking, is there a plan, that, like something pictorial or a sketch that I can pass on to my ratepayers? Councillor Osborne, we received a very detailed map um, oh, yeah. a few uh, council meetings ago, um, and we can dig it out of the uh, agenda package from that meeting. Uh, well, with a are they shutting off access to the wide, the whole front of the school so that people aren't driving in and out? Is that the plan, Peter? Yes, what, what they're doing is there's separate entrance for the buses and a separate entrance is for the cars. For the so pickup. that will be the parents to pick up their kids. That's correct. So they won't just be a free for all coming out onto 141. Right now it's a free for all. 
Yeah, no. Because they're coming in and out all the time, all different areas in front of the school, right? No, it actually be got um, directional. So the school buses will come in off the highway and then they'll go through the clearing. They'll come on Tom Free Drive and then they'll turn on Tom Free Drive. Okay, what, what clearing? Because the whole front is cleared. <laughs> like what part of the clearing does the buses come in and out of? Does it come out on Humphrey? Yes, they come out on Humphrey, onto okay. Humphrey Drive. So and we were, the, so we were going to decide they'll be coming out on Sandy Plains. Oh, the other side is Sandy Plains. Well, that, the, front, the access to the parking lot of the school, as we know it, is that going to be barricaded totally on 141? It will be on the 141 will be a bus entrance and a car entrance, but not an exit. Oh, so cars will come in off 141 and out onto Sandy Plains. Buses go in on 141 and out on Humphrey. That's correct. That's so that there's some they have to rip order. every pine tree in sight out of there. Okay. So uh, who's taking that? Like, if this got to be done before the school year, who's taking all those stumps out? Well, they've got a contractor all lined up. The trees were removed, and they're having a pre-construction meeting next week, and we're still waiting for the MTO to make up their mind what they're doing. Okay, but you realize the size of the root balls on all those trees. It's going to be the whole thing's going to be like cultivated. Anyway, uh, 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 did we have to? Did we have to put a culvert in any way under Humphrey Drive to facilitate the drainage? Is that right? Yes, we okay. we 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 have to. And if it were an okay. MTO contract. It could be next year, and right. if the parking lot was finished, there'd be no outlet for their drainage. So, okay, that's Great. the purpose of doing right. it together, right. so that it's done all at once. Got it. Thanks, Peter. Um, and we have one more question from Councillor Moffat. I, I, Peter, I think this is a great cooperation between two neighbors to get it done before the kids come back. We're if we're trying hard. Yeah. Okay, so, Moffitt, thank you, Mayor. Uh, you may, people may have missed it, but I believe in the, on page nine of the addendum package was actually a, a really good visual. And I think it was a result yeah, of discussions, my discussions with Tom the other day, because I was trying to understand. Um, yes, yes, nice black and white. <laughs> I was trying to understand the words to the context. And I think the picture helped, but I just wanted to get clarification, Peter. The, we're doing work, then and then we're billing tower construction for some of that work, and then or sorry, sorry, tower construction is doing some of the work, and then they're billing us for it, and then we're billing it to the MTO. We, in, in other words, we're the let's let's put it this way: an MTO work, we're the general contractor. They would okay. be doing, they would submit invoices. We do our work. We send the package to the MTO, the MTO comes back. Um, and once the agreement's in place, it's just a matter of, uh, of uh, all the engineering is done. Uh, yep. Everything's ready to go except for some bell relocates right now. And once that's done, the project gets finished, it gets uh, uh, approved or their engineers look at it, and then there's a payment. So if I'm looking at the diagram, Peter, and I'm, hopefully you have it in front of you, I was so then again, just as a follow up here, I'm trying to understand what work that tower construction would be doing the that red. we would then be billing MTO. So all of the all of the red is I thought they were billing the the, the school all board. Of the, all of the red is the work that tower construction is doing uh, on behalf of the school board um, on MTO lands. So okay. the work that they do there is separate and only okay. for a go. And okay. then All right. the piece you see there is the, the white piece is going to be yep. the excavation okay. and, and the paving of that section. And then the ditch line that goes along over to uh, uh, to the uh, ditch line here. Okay. So, sorry, I, I, I wasn't clear on, I didn't realize that the red square was MTO land. I thought it was uh, school board the land. Robot. Oh, that's right. Okay. That okay. Yeah, and it's the variable cost that we're going to be reimbursed for. Correct. Because the labor is the labor for the staff. 
Um, well, we're, we're putting in for $80,000 and that's what the contract is for. And part yes, of that, our allocation and part of that is from the, uh, from tower. But under the agreement, labor costs are not part of it. Well, there's a, there, okay. There are, we are, we have, this is what the agreement is we've sent out to the MTO and the MTO will be coming back with their comments. Okay. But as, how much, for, how how much, Peter, how much staff time is this going to take? And, and do we have the staff to take off our normal routines to do this work? It's one culvert and it's ditching in sand. It's a so, couple days work. Two men? It's not much. Two, two men for a few days? Yes. An excavator and a crew putting a culvert in, gravel, ditching, ditching along the, in and, front of the municipal building. And all the, all the stump removal, both on the MTO road right away and on the school property is all being done by tower. Uh, everything, any stump removal that's done on, on, in the white portion of the drawing and the addendum, we yep. would be doing. Yep. Yep. Anything on the red portion would be would be done by tower and who does and the course, part outside the between the red portion and the school those stumps because they're all yeah, done well that's that's the actual contract for the school work that's no, no. not part of this mto shared agreement so all so, the work in front from right. the red to the school yes, is all right. the uh the work that the uh, school board is doing under their contract they, so who's taking the rest of the are they at least leaving the rest of the stumps then no. That are between no. the red zone and the school? Tower is going to no. do the work that's going to be part of the MTO work in red, and they're also doing the rest of the, the project. They got the contract for the whole thing. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'd like to call a vote on this. Yeah, quick. Thank you for the detailed explanation, and let's hope it gets done before school starts. Um, we've got a motion on the floor, moved by Gail, seconded by Daryl. And could I have a vote on this? All in favor of the cost sharing agreement. Thank you, and that's carried. Peter, congratulations on helping to move it forward. I just hope it works. <laughs> we do too. Good luck. Good luck. Yeah. Um, I have um, a motion that as per the recommendation of staff report PW-RD-2020-014, the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Seguin does hereby approve the purchase of one safe pace, 100 driver feedback sign and data collector from Cedar Signs for approximately $4,000 plus taxes and the purchase of 12 rumble strips from Ecoflex for approximately $3,000 plus taxes to be funded from the contingency funds. Could I have a motion from Councillor Osborne. So moved. So moved. And seconded by Terry Felder. Seconded. Thank you. Um, and I would like Peter, thank you very much for moving so quickly on this to give us some a little bit of background in your research. Sure. Um, basically, uh, Council had asked for some speed control measures on municipal roads in the township. Um, we have anecdotal evidence or, or reports that people are speeding on secondary roads, uh, but we don't have any data to prove it. Um, if you're standing on the side of a road, it's going, and there's a car going by you at 60 kilometers an hour, that seems a lot faster than 60. So in other words, we don't have the data um, to prove that we have speeding on our roads. So. Um, I spoke with uh, Jeremy McDonald of the West Perry Sound OPP and uh, in the past what we did is we'd hire off duty or paid duty policemen to sit in, in areas uh, where there was uh, suspected speeding and, and violations, uh, but they don't do that anymore. Uh, what they do is they've relied on the CPAC, uh, Community Policing Advisory Board, and they look for feedback from communities to highlight areas of concern. So basically what he, what he recommended was getting some data on speeds 
uh, and get some kind of history on it. And then they can use that data to target hotspots and higher, higher and get a higher level of success and be more focused in, in uh, their enforcement. So that's uh, the one part. So the, the radars, the radar that we have recommended is uh, really a simple unit. It's not very expensive. Um, McKellar is using it right now quite effectively and it creates some really, really good data for them. And on top of that, they're looking to buy another one. And so uh, McDougall as well are gonna look to buy a couple of these as well for their secondary roads. Um, if, you, if you look in appendix two, you'll see what kind of data and what kind of reports come out of this this radar or this radar unit. And one of the real benefits is it's cloud-based. So you can access the information anywhere at any time. So it's an ongoing, it's ongoing data collection on whatever road you want to put it on. Um, the second one, we've always had trouble with Humphrey Drive uh, because of the convenience store. And there's always people going in at, you know, going fast because they're, you know, uh, want to get home. Uh, and we've had a lot of complaints about speed. Uh, we've, the, the, the Tatham report shows all the different types of methods of speed control that have been tried all over the country. We went through that process and council decided the best way to deal with it was paid duty officers. And in the past, we did put some speed bumps down, but they were ripped up really quickly because they were too aggressive and the people didn't like them. Now, this particular product that we found is a Canadian product and it's like a rumble strip that you would find on the side of, it's got the, the coarseness of the side of the highway. So if you wander off the lane, it sort of wakes you up. It's, it's really very simple. It's just a flat mat that interlocks and it's a coarse, it's a coarse uh, rib. So you'll definitely notice it when you drive over it. It's really a low cost. Um, uh, in the case of Humphrey and or here at the convenience store, putting two on uh, uh, Sandy Plains Road and two on Humphrey Drive would catch people coming from either direction. And I don't think it's as invasive as a speed bump. It's just sort of annoying. And I think that's sort of what you want to do uh, when you can't have police around all the time. You're just trying to manage the uh, manage the speed with a static object so those are the recommendations that we have and uh and, you know any questions yep we've got some questions councillor cole yeah a couple of uh, comments first of all i think the the uh, pace uh, signs actually really work but i would recommend we have more than one i'd recommend we have at least two that's just my recommendation. My question is um, on the rumble strips or the echo flare. Is there any issue with snow plows? They still stay down in the winter, or do you, you lift them? They're just like a mat. You just lay them on the ground. They're not. They're not attached to anything. They weigh fifty pounds a piece, wow. so they just lay on the road. So do you, do you pick them up for the winter? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, that was the at the end of the season. You would just take it off. I mean. Right. Okay. We, we may have to drill a hole in it to make sure somebody doesn't take them away. But Don't take them away. Okay. Yeah. But, that was but it, you know. Okay. Thanks. It's, it's, it's worth trying. I, I, I think it would have some, some benefit. Yeah, sure. And I, I, I agree with um, Councillor Coles. If we can afford to, it would be great. The model that Peter is recommending is movable, so it can go from one place to another. So we yeah. can collect data in multiple places. Um, Councillor Finson is next. I uh, just want to say thanks to Peter for all his hard work regarding the traffic. Um, one question, it can be used, they can be used on MTO highways? No, well. Mm, because that doesn't serve my purpose at all. <laughs> <laughs> that, right? I've, I've been dealing with this for now, you, coming on my third year, and I'm going to be told again, it's not going to work for me. <laughs> I just heard well, you say it. I wasn't sure until I just heard you say it. You need the safe base. 
you, you, you can turn it off and it still collects data. So you can turn the flashing radar off, but it actually collects. Can we get permission from MTO to put them on our highways? Because I will do that. We've got some connections that we've been talking to, and hopefully, you know, they will I think allow I, I think us. I've been given permission once already, but I didn't want to have to pay for it. So I, I, I didn't pursue that, but I can, and I would love to, and I think two is a great idea as well. But I'd like to say thank you, and should I go forward trying to get permission if we do purchase these? Uh, I think we've got dialogue with Glenn, uh, Glenn Kraft right yes. now from the MTO, and he responds very quickly. So I think we can, I think okay. you would talk to him. He's been really responsive. So, okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Let's leave it with Peter and see how he does. I think the other thing that this has done is uh, the newspaper article. Uh, about our last council meeting um, upset the OPP significantly um, because they weren't consulted and um, both Peter and I had very aggressive phone calls from them um, and I think the one good thing coming out of that is that now they're part of the dialogue and they are collecting data with us uh, and providing some of it so I think there's there's better cooperation than we've had before um, so, um, although we shouldn't have been in the paper without discussing it with our uh, highway traffic partners, um, I think we've got some cooperation going forward. Councillor Moffat. Uh, thanks. I agree with the comments. I think two would be better than one uh, in terms of the sign. But I guess, Peter, my main question is, is um, what is the plan for the sign to move it around or the two signs, what is the, what is the plan for the, the township? You've obviously had input from councillors with regards to uh, roads where, you know, uh, and I've had some follow up with some people that said, we got to get one on Horseshoe, you know, Horseshoe Lake Road. And you've done other things on that road, to try to, you know, um, limit the speed. But I'm just wondering both in terms of the strips and the signs, um, more so the signs in terms of a plan, but are we looking at moving the strips around as well to various locations? Um, is, your, is this a plan that you've developed or are you looking for input from us or residents? What's the, what is your thought? Um, the, primarily the strips was really focused on a residential area in, a, in an area where there's uh, a lot of people like, like Sandy Plains Road this is something that the people would actually look out for as well and, and sort of keep an eye on it. And in, in a higher speed road like Horseshoe Lake Road, uh, it would probably work as well. But uh, the radar units is what we would put out and collect data. And we move it around to, uh, I've got a complaint today from Blackstone Crane Lake Road mm -hmm. that there's uh, speeding going on there. And you've mentioned Rankin Lake Road. Right, and then we have Horseshoe Lake Road. So this is a data collection device that you yep. can move around and randomly move around and then you, you collect data. And once you have data, you can go to the OPP and say, here's the chart. You know, there's 150 events here and 40% and of the people were speeding. So, you know, if you look at the reports, they're really quite good. Yep. And, and, and I understand that, Peter, but I guess my question is, is what is the plan for the strips and what is the plan for the sign? Are you going to put it on Rankin Lake Road for a month, collect data, and then you're going to move it over to, um, you know, if, if Gail is able to, you know, move it over to Rosso for a month. And like that, that's what I, that's what I'm trying to understand. Yes, is that's what it's for. It's having not, the equipment isn't going to help us. Exactly what I want to know what the plan is if you've started to formulate that. Well, the, the plan is it's a portable radar detection unit and it also flashes your speed and we can move it into our perceived uh, problem areas and typically uh, with the batteries in there um, and uh, uh, to make it really portable that would last up to 10 days. So we could get a week's data from any location wherever we put this. 
And okay, that would so be the you plan. are working on a plan. You're working on a plan with regards to the, the sign as well as the strips. It sounds like for sure. location. We, okay, sure. thank. You. Be moved no, I around. We, I mean, I, at councils, you know, council's going to say where do, where should we put yeah, this sign? Yeah, a list from what roads and a minimum of a week data is essential for the OPP because they need to see every day of the week and they need to see um, what times of day for at least a week maybe more, uh, and that's been our discussion. So once, I mean, we've already got a list of some ratepayer complaints. We've got some lists of roads from councillors. Feed them into Peter, and we will move the sign around. I think it's a budget question whether we can afford one or two signs. Okay, um, thank you. Councillor Osborne and then Councillor Fellner, and then I'm going to cut the discussion off. Thank you. So it seems like members of staff and council have been talking to the OPP. Unbeknownst they called us <laughs> very aggressively. Well, they didn't call me, but they accused me. So I have it's in your addendum. I've shot a letter back to Jeremy McDonald, acting commander. He's being replaced uh, very shortly with a commander from Aurelia. He's stepping back as a regular sergeant. Uh, I didn't appreciate his comments. There's been no CPAC meeting since last August. He refuses to do virtual meetings because he said it's not secure. So I have no use for the guy. And the fact that he picks something up from the media and then starts accusing counselors, none of which I believe have spoken to the media. Uh, the two counselors that raised the issue, Councillor Vincent and Councillor Moffat on speed, I don't believe either of you have spoken to the media. They picked it up off a Zoom meeting, the media, and he picks it up and starts throwing darts, okay? So I don't expect to be cooperating with Jeremy McDonald anytime soon. My issue here is two things. These, these portable units, Peter, are they on posts? Are they on a little wagon with wheels? Or when you say they're portable, could you explain? All I'm seeing is the sign. Well, we're going to make them into a portable unit that would be heavy enough that would stay in a position. We'd weld a frame for it. We'd, we'd make it, make it a, a steady durable um, uh, unit. Yeah. Something, you could change, change, something you could chain to a pole or a tree. That's correct, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, so it would be portable. You could tow it to another location easily. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it, ultimately we could do that. I mean, but it'll be a, a, a heavy steel frame that it's sitting on and it'll be Or be you could run it, up, run it up on a pickup or whatever. Yeah. That's correct, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that I would recommend to at least as well of these, what are they called? 100s? Safe pace 100 feedback sign? Yes, they're uh, safe pace 100 yeah. driver feedback sign. Now we did have, as you mentioned, speed bumps, true speed bumps mm -hmm. on Sandy Plains yeah. Road. Uh, some contractors really got nasty about, about those as did some of the residents. They were concerned about their suspension. These strips sounds like a good idea, like a rumble strip, but I am concerned about the portability of these things getting swiped. Uh, or if somebody doesn't like them, just pick, pick them up, put them in their truck and, and junk them on us. Like, can we not nail them down uh, four corners at least into the roadbed so they're not too accessible? If we have to, we can do that. Yes, it's-, it's well, after it, the first one goes missing, that's probably an appropriate procedure, right? If, if they are taken away, then they must be effective. <laughs> If somebody wants to get rid of them, then they must be effective. But they're three thousand bucks, so, right? How many strips? They're two hundred dollars a piece. Okay, so you're buying three thousand dollars worth. Fifteen of them for sixteen. Well, there's, there's some freight included, but actually, uh, McDougal and McKellar. Oh, it, it was twelve. Twelve rumble sticks, three thousand. Okay, so you're two or three hundred bucks a piece. All right, I'm I'm good with that. Uh, well. But, you know, as a CPAC member, I was unaware that now OPP no longer responds to calls for radar patrol on our roads. They were, we were never told that. That's news I'm gleaning from you people who have been talking to Jeremy and company. Well, we I'm all learned sure. something the last two I'm weeks. Not, I'm me. not sure he even knows that because he gets our reports messed up. He sent us the second quarter reports and they ended up to be the first quarter reports. So okay, I'm not too. Councillor Felder has a comment. 
Hope he's watching. <laughs> yeah, I have a, a comment and a, well, not a comment. I have a question. Two, two questions. Sure. So on, on the South Sandy Plains Road, you intend to put your speed bumps between the variety store and 141 Highway, correct? Two of them, two of them equidistant, probably a third, a third, one third, two thirds. It's just that portion of the road. So, because there is a pit down the South Sandy Plains Road that they haul out of. Yes, there is, there is. So the thing is, he'll be able to go, he'll be able to go and Turn right and go around by the and come out by the township office and not hit any speed bump. Well, well, we we loaded, bought loaded another truck for loaded both truck. to prevent people from getting around slowing down. Yeah, um, but I don't think the amplitude of these rumble strips—they're only about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half right. high. I don't think they're going to be a big problem uh, for a truck, but it was some I'd like. To, would be nice to try it out and see. That's yeah. That's, it's just a you got to you, gotta, you know the, the, because there is a there is a pit down that road that they all commercially own. Oh, right? I, I understand. Now these and my, sec my second these question. are in the middle of the road, so oh, okay. one wheel will only like it'll be. It's eleven feet wide. The road is eighteen feet, so it's not. It's it's too wide for a car to go around. Sure. So there's always going to be one set of wheels going on the rumble strips. Okay. So my second question is in regards to these is sort of along the lines of Daryl. So I I understand you want we want to buy the machines that are going to record data and this data is going to give us, you know, some history as to what roads are potentially sped on and what aren't. But so other than just advising the OPP of the data, what what Sort of what's the second phase of this plan? Are we going to, in the roads that we find that are habitually, you know, being driven on too fast, are we going to have a, a plan to put, you know, a permanent warning uh, uh, device in like they have down on Muskoka Lakes? They pretty much got them in every, you know, every little village you go through. Um, you know, you come up to them, it tells you what your speed is, and it's red until you go, you know, until you're down slow enough and it's green, and it really deters people. They really slow down, and uh, I think they work. Is that the second part yeah, of it? That, that's part of it. And the other part of it is if we have bylaws, if we find that people are way are going way faster than the speed limit, we can adjust the bylaw and the speed limits on the roads. Um, okay. That's really getting the data and understanding what the traffic speeds are will, will give us uh, information to make decisions on, uh, you know. Okay. It's, but that's what the plan is. We're gonna move it around and get data to work with. Yeah, and I think there's a problem. Once we have the data, we can have a public education um, pitch too through the web and through Dominique and through Twitter and everything, announcing that it is a problem. But we need the data to talk to the OPP, to talk to the public, to actually record is it trucks that are speeding, is it people, and when is it happening? And so I think this is a, it, again, it's a very first step. Yeah, it's Tell a first step. Councillor Vincent, you have your hand up. Sorry, I didn't mean to have my hand up. But again, just while I did have my hand up, I will just say that if, if we, we have data that says people are really speeding like crazy, I know my roads, the MTO will then take action. Like they will then do something like the, the painting of the road. They will make a decision if they have the data. So that's just input. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. That's okay. Um, we have... We have a motion here, um, and I'm wondering if anybody would like to amend it to buy two of the safe pace high driver yeah. feedback signs. Yeah. Oh. Yep. Yep. Uh, Rod Osborne moved it, and it was seconded by Terry Fellner. So if they're open to the friendly amendment <laughs> to make it two and double the cost. If you two are open to the friendly amendment to make it to and double the cost from 4,000 to 8,000 for the safe pace driver feedback signs, 
we can just write that in. And Councillor Osborne, are you okay with that? I agree. And Councillor Zellner, so can mm -hmm. I just write this one? Yes. Yeah. Autograph the each one. Read the resolution again. Okay. Okay, this is the resolution that as per recommendation of staff report number PWRD 2020 014, the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Seguin does hereby approve the purchase of two Safe Pace 100 driver feedback sign and data collector from Cedar Signs for approximately $8,000 plus taxes and the purchase of 12 rumble strips from Ecoflex for approximately $3,000 plus taxes to be funded from the contingency fund. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for taking the first step. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Mayor. Thank uh, do I have to read this whole thing? Mayor. Oh, oh dear. Okay, Peter, don't go away. This is a big one. Mayor. From to, yes, Count, Councillor Moffat. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Just to, it was more. It's more of a question for uh, uh, Michelle uh, as CFO. When do we expect our next financial update, Michelle? At the next meeting of council. Uh, we'll get an update on the contingency fund or the contingency. And thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you, thank you Mayor. Okay, this, is, this, is, okay, this is regarding the Blue Box program. Um, Peter will talk to it, but it is a lengthy resolution, so bear with me. Whereas the amount of single-use plastics leaking into our lakes, rivers, and waterways is a growing area of public concern, and whereas reducing the waste we generate and reincorporating valuable resources from our waste stream into new goods can reduce greenhouse gases significantly. And whereas the transition to full producer responsibility for packaging paper and paper products is critical to reducing waste, improving recycling, and driving better economic and environmental outcomes. And whereas the move to a circular economy is a global movement and the transition of the blue box program would go a long way towards this outcome. And whereas the Township of Seguin is supportive of a timely, seamless and successful transition of blue box programs to full financial and operational responsibility by producers of packaging, paper, and paper products. And whereas the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, AMO, has requested municipal governments with blue box programs to provide an indication of the best date to transition our blue box program to full producer responsibility Therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Seguin would like to transition their Blue Box program to full producer responsibility in 2024, and that this decision is based on the following rationale. One, our contract for the collection and processing of Blue Box materials is a monthly contract and that the Township of Seguin would be interested in providing collection services to producers should we be able to arrive at mutually agreeable commercial terms. And further, that any questions regarding this resolution can be directed to the Township CAO at cao.seguin.ca, and for, further that this resolution be forwarded to the Association of Municipalities of Ontario AMO and the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Could I have a motion from uh, Councillor Felder? So moved. Thank you. And a seconder from Ted Collins. I'll second that. Thank you. Um, Peter, do you want to take us through a little bit of your rationale? Yes. Um, actually, um, the the preamble was from AMO to give you a background, basically what the blue box transition timeline and framework was. Um, I, I'm, the first thing I want to say is that the blue box program, there was a talk, there was a memo, there was actually or a couple resolutions from some townships uh, in a previous council meeting that were, that mentioned that House uh, municipalities with households of less than 5,000 
would not be part of the blue box program or the transition. Well, it didn't take long for the message to get to the minister and he's retracted that. So anybody who's a, who's a, a, a participating in a blue box program right now will continue to do so. Um, I spoke to AMO uh, at the end of, end of June and into early July to get an update of what, what the other municipalities were doing. To be honest with you, to this date, they still don't have rules and regulations for the producers and what their, what their expectations are and what kind of deals they can make, how, how they're going to handle this pursuit, uh, consumer responsibility or producer responsibility. So, so where we are, where we are right now is it looks like approximately 40% of the municipalities want to shed their recycling responsibilities in 2023. Um, and most of these municipalities have blue box pickups. So they don't have really a lot of capital invested in it. They just have blue boxes and a contractor comes along and, and takes the product. So anybody who doesn't have infrastructure, a lot of investment in blue box is really interested in getting out of it as soon as possible. Um, and then uh, the balance of the municipalities, 30% in 2024 and 30% in 2025 is about the mix. Well, smaller municipalities like us, we've invested money into our infrastructure. So we have transfer sites, we have sites where we collect it, we have a system that works. Um, it's, it's very likely that we're going to have to negotiate or we're going to have to make a deal with uh, producers to, that they pay for this. And, and the question is, at this time, we don't know what they're obligated to pay. They're, we're not, we don't know anything about the terms and conditions. But the reality is we've got existing infrastructure that we want to, to well, at this point, it's the best deal we have so far. If the, there could be negotiations and they may say, we, we don't want to use any of yours, any of your transfer sites anymore for collection of blue box. Um, it may be go down to district of Muskoka. We don't, we don't know what the, what the contract terms and so on are. Um, so at this stage right now, we really don't know. And in this report, I made a recommendation that we wait a year and see what happens with the, the first year of the transition. I was fortunate enough to get a call from Mike Barrett, who is the director of CIF. And CIF funded most of our uh, uh, compact and recycling bins. They put money into our system and uh, um, that's, that's really where we got the support to do it in the first place. And what he tells me is based on his discussions and his knowledge, which is a lot more than mine, he recommends that we go to 2023. As soon as we can get out of the blue box obligation, line up and try and get out of it as soon as possible. And for the, the main reason is it's a first year and there'll be a lot of political pressure to make sure that the municipalities are happy and that you know the system the system uh, starts to to work in the second year uh, a little less and in the third year he figures uh, the system's already sorted out there's nothing to negotiate here it is take it or leave it so he recommends it would be better if we went into 2023 and it wouldn't affect us very much because we have a month to month contract with uh, waste connections canada and I've been trying to talk to the general manager for some time now, and I just can't seem to connect with her. But the reality is, if they don't do that work anymore, they're out of business. So they're, they're going to be part of the solution in some way, but we don't know where it is yet. So um, that's really the long and short of it. And uh, my recommend after the conversation with, with Mr. Barrett, uh, if we pushed it up to 2023, uh, doesn't guarantee that we're going to transition then. It's just that we would, we would recommend or we would like to uh, transition in 2023. Uh, the ministry is going to make that decision for us anyway. But um, so that, that's it in a nutshell. Um, 
recommending we change the, the resolution to 2023? This is, this is what, what he told me and it made a lot of sense. He said, in the first round, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll offer you steak. In the second round, they'll offer you a nice sandwich. And then third year, they'll offer you a hot dog. So <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sure there'll be money. I'm sure there'll be money in the first year. Councillor Osborne first, please. Thank you, Mayor. What is our blue box blue box program in Seguin right now? Peter? Uh, how do you I, mean? I don't see any blue boxes at transfer sites. We see wet garbage and we see paper and cardboard and fibers. Well the blue box the blue box program is the contents of those blue boxes. Some some municipalities use them as a curbside pickup. Right, but and, we don't. You know, so so how do how do we enable blue box and sequin when we just have transfer sites? Blue box is really a general discuss, uh, description of uh, consumer post consumer recycling. Yes, that, that's but what it's all called. I see when I I got my wet I got my wet garbage and garbage bags. And I got my paper and fibers and boxes and stuff like that. That's the only thing I can separate. Oh, and bottles, right? right. But other than that, okay. we're, we're not into the full blue box program here right now, correct? Um, we are participating in we all of the things that we collect right now yes. are accepted in the blue box system, just like anywhere in the okay. province. And we deal with waste connections. Waste Connections is our contractor. So when that, when the bid is full. Yes, and that's yes. right, they get shipped there. When we deal with Waste Connections, you know where the ultimate destination is. Uh, they've got, they sell the cardboard and they have, they sort uh, the plastics. All the plastic, all the bundled recyclables that Waste Connections took down, there was a CBC documentary with a nationwide person that's right on this was shocked to see Waste Connections puts all that recycled material in a landfill down so yeah. It ends up in landfill. She was shocked. So this this diversion we do here, it still ends up in a landfill, just somewhere else. Now that's, that's not the intent, and that's what the well, government I know it's is. It's not the intent, but it's a fact. Check it out with head office Waste Connections. Where do they end up putting the recycled replastic, recycled plastic goes to landfill. Now, secondly. The producers are supposed to be penalized or responsible for packaging, correct? Correct. How correct. in the world, and Canada's been talking about this for years, how in the world can oh. you make producers be accountable for packaging when 75 to 80% of our products come in offshore, prepackaged, in bubble that, pack? That's part of the... Uh, that's part of it as well. They're, they yeah. have to standardize you know the material. I, you know what I mean? I'm just not, not asking you to answer, Peter, because you don't have the answer. I'm just throwing that out there. This is so farcical in its dreamland. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we, we know there's not a lot of answers, uh, but I do, Councillor Moffat, I'll acknowledge you in a minute. I do believe <laughs> that it is our intent to recycle as much as we can. That is our Blue Box program. That's what it's named as a provincial program. Um, and we have to keep doing our very, very best. Councillor Moffat. Uh, Mayor, thank you. Just with regards to the resolution and just Peter's comment, I believe the third one from the bottom, if I heard correctly, and it says the and that the municipality of, of the township of Seagan would be interested in providing collection services to producers. Is am I did I hear that correctly? Yes, in yes, because we have the infrastructure up here. Okay. It's a collection facility for them. Okay. It's 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 really a glor it's it's really just a compacting yep. blue box yep. as opposed to curbside. So we have an infrastructure here that that uh, the producers would be very interested in, and I okay. think waste connections will be part of that. But but we don't know yet. So it's just sort of open at this stage. Okay, okay. But what I thought I heard you is that we were trying to get out of that business. So that so may so I I just wanted to make sure our resolution was consistent with what you just said. And it sounds like it is, Peter. So then the question I would have is, we've collected, we've done all this collection. We've got all this material sitting in our transfer stations. What are we doing with it then? If we, if we are sort of taking on the responsibility of being the holder of the waste. It's a producer's responsibility to look after the recycled material. 
Okay. And in, and in Seguin Township, we're collecting it right now at this time. If the producer comes along and says, you know what, what we're going to do now, is we're going to put a big bin in the middle of Seguin somewhere, and you put all your recycling in there, then that's what they're going to do. But we have an opportunity to negotiate because we have an existing infrastructure. And frankly, we've got a couple million dollars worth of, uh, of capital assets in there that we'd like to get paid for. So, Correct. And that's, that's what the plan is. So um, we'd like to transition. That's what the resolution is. We'd like to transition into the producer as early as possible. And then when, when they come to talk to us, we're going to, we have a, a better opportunity where we have an opportunity to actually get more cost recovery of our infrastructure that we already have existing. We actually are going to have to pay for it. Depends on how the negotiations go, but that's that's what the uh, the opportunity presents itself. We'll have to see what happens when we get there. But we're we're um, setting ourselves up to be able to do that. So just to summarize, then we will be holding the materials that we are expecting the producers to pay us for, and that's why we want to be in that business. We want to. Well, no, well, <laughs> we don't you might be well, holding the materials. We have we have the in, we have the infrastructure. Yep. I understand that. When the producer that. comes along and says, "Okay, guess what, Siegel? We're gonna we got to talk about how we're gonna get your collect your materials." Yes. We say to them, "We've already got it collected for you. What kind of a deal can we make? Right. How are you right. going to do this?" Okay. That's that's really what it's it is. And that and that's what I that's what I just that's what I thought I summarized, Peter. But maybe I was. But that's what I thought we were trying to do. Thank you. Okay. Um, do I have, uh, Peter, I hear you saying let's move it to 223. It was moved by Terry Fellner and um, seconded by Ted Collins. Are you too comfortable with that friendly amendment to move it to 2023 on the resolution? Terry? Yes? Uh, Councillor Collins? Councillor Collins, yes. 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 Okay. Great. So th I, can I just write this in? Here's yes. Yes, I can. Sure what's going on there. Okay. And um, this is setting us up to learn and participate. So could I have a um, call for a vote? All in favor of the resolution. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Your great work in very uncertain times. <laughs> okay, we're moving on to business schedule number nine. Um, and this is the scheduling of the introductory meetings with our new integrity commissioner. Um, I'll turn it over to the clerk for this. Well, I think the memo is pretty self-explanatory. We're looking for council to give us the time out of this chart. And that's when the integrity commissioner is going to set up the Zoom meetings with the individual members of council. So Mayor McDermott is the first meeting. That's the request of the integrity commissioner. Uh, 2 p.m. July 29th would be Councillor Moff, and he's already requested that. So I need the other five members of council to put themselves into the remaining time slot. Hopefully, you can make this work, and we need to do this tonight. So. It's this is not something I want emails later. We have to settle this tonight. If I get emails later, we won't get a result. So I'm, I guess if everybody could just um, say when they would like their meeting, um, I'm going to go ward by ward. Um, so Councillor Moffat's already put a time in. Um, Councillor Cole, do you have a preference? Uh, the 30th works. Either time doesn't matter. Pick one. Thir uh, the morning. <laughs> Okay. Um, Councillor Osborne. Uh, what's today? The 20th. Wow. Um, August 6th, 10 a.m. Um, a.m. Okay. Yep. Uh, Councillor Feller. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, can you unmute? Wednesday the 5th at 10 would be fine for me. Okay, Councillor Collins? 
Oh, you're on mute too. What did Councillor Fellner say? Pardon? What was Councillor Fellner's on Wednesday at 10 a.m.? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the fifth at 10. Yeah, that's me. That's where I want it. But... Let me think about it for a second. Okay, Councillor Finn. Okay, you're gonna have that one. I'll take two o'clock. I don't care. Huh? I said take take okay. that one. I'll take two. Okay, Councillor Collins is in the morning on the 5th, yep. and Councillor yep. Felder is on the afternoon of the 5th. Councillor Finson. I'll take the last one, which is the 30th at 2 p.m. <laughs> yeah. That's the last one, so the uh, 30th at 2 p.m. Here, how long does that interview expect to last? She said it, 45 minutes. What? Um, what? She will set up the Zoom call. I don't have 45 minutes, sorry. I'll give her 15 or 20. Okay, it's an important link into council. Um, item B, 9B got moved to closed. So we can skip okay. over that. Um, item C is really just the notes from our last regional meeting. Uh -huh. And um, we have a resolution in support of and this is going around to all of the um, municipalities in West Perry Sound, East Perry Sound, and Muskoka. Some of them have already passed it. So this is to support the regional getting together and a regional strategy in, first, in, in uh, principle. There's no dollars associated with it. So I will read the motion and then ask for some movers and seconders. Whereas the Township of Seguin understands the federal priority of ensuring broadband access to 95% of all homes by 2026 and 100% of homes in 2030, and the province of Ontario's priority of supporting infrastructure development programs through the recently announced Improving Connectivity in Ontario program. And whereas the Township of Seguin recognizes that there are homes and or businesses in the municipality that do not have access to affordable, reliable, and adequate broadband internet that meets the national standard of at least 50 megabits download and 10 mm -hmm. megabits download. And whereas the Town of Seguin acknowledges the availability of reliable broadband internet services to all residences and businesses throughout the municipality as critical to economic growth, social prosperity, and community well-being. And whereas the Township of Seguin acknowledges recent pressures imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic on local governments to advocate for improved broadband service availability and improvement to support functions such as working from home, e-learning from home, remote and virtual healthcare service delivery, and increased demand for in-home entertainment. And whereas the Township of Seguin is aware of the development of the Muskoka Perry Sound Riding Cooperative Broadband Initiative focused on developing a model for a collective, multi-regional strategy for creating and deploying broadband to all residents throughout both districts. And whereas the Township of Seguin recognizes that this initiative relies on the partnership efforts of all affected municipalities, the P Perry Sound Muskoka Community Network the West Perry Sound Smart Community Network, Blue Sky, health agencies, schools, district social services board, economic development organizations, and other supportive partners and or agencies. Therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Seguin does hereby declare their support in principle for the Muskoka Perry Sound Riding Cooperative Broadband Initiative to develop and implement a riding-wide strategy to ensure the availability of reliable broadband services to all residents within the Muskoka and Perry Sound districts. And further, that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Seguin wishes to be added to any communication lists for the initiative as to be kept informed of new developments and opportunities to provide support. Could I have a motion from Councillor Cole? I so move. Thank you. And a seconder from Councillor Finson. I second that. Is there any discussion? 
Councilor Moffat. Yeah, who is Blue Sky Economic Growth Corporation? Or Blue Sky, I guess that's what it's defined as. It's, it's a collaborative, very similar to SMART, um, and the par but it, it tends to be servicing East Perry Sound. So they have right. to be there. Right. It's very similar to SMART in that they've been lobbying for broadband and internet, and they provide some of it. But their regional focus has been East Perry Sound and much further north, like way further north. Okay. And, okay. And I believe they're like core. They're like core communications. They're infrastructure. They're fed, uh, Blue Sky is fed, funded entirely by FedNor. I know that. I met them at the municipal meeting with Ted. They're they're like core. It's just to make sure all the regional groups are in it, Daryl. Um, any other further discussion? All in favor? Thank you, and that's carried. Um, hmm. um, this is really for information. Um, the North Bay District Health Unit is uh, recommending or mandating uh, masks starting uh, next Friday, the 24th. Um, and as you recall, we are strongly recommending it. I think you're going to find more and more of the retailers are have a sign on their door, masks only, please. Um, is there any discussion on that? Uh, the next item is, again, um, for information. We've talked about this before. We believe that the statistics on infectious diseases, all infectious diseases, need to be by smaller chunks of the region so that East and West Perry Sound can be broken up. Uh, Jamie McGarvey is, tends to be leading this initiative um, to uh, really make sure we're getting the data that's related to us. Councillor Osborne. The attached letter to that item and uh, the letter from to Doug Ford from Jamie McGarvey asking the health units not to count people's main addresses in the city for cases that occur up here because it skews the cases. If you get sick up here and you need treatment, you're counted as somebody from down south. And they want the system to be, the system of publishing stats to be changed because the health units are not that's wanting to do it. Says, and so he's gone over Chirico's head to Ford. Yep, that's exactly what we have in front of us. Yep, yep. Is there any other comments on that one? That's true of broken legs and appendicitis, too. It's true of everything that gets serviced here. But um, you know, it's, broken legs are not contagious. <laughs> no, but the funding associated with fixing a broken leg goes to where the broken leg person lives, not where it got fixed. So there is, a, there is an issue. Um, the next item, 255, is a petition uh, about the cell tower, um, and it came uh, to the clerk. I'd like him to address it a little bit in terms of his concern that we can't tell whether the signatories are ratepayers. Uh, yes, the mayor and I had a brief discussion when this came in. Uh, it's all apparently online. So I'm only assuming that those addresses that aren't Seguin are Seguin properties, seasonal properties, but I don't know that. Um, have no idea. There's no signatures. It simply looks like something you just go online and put a name and a, a city or town in and the date, I guess. But I don't know that. I, this is all I've seen, the same as you. So it, it's not what I would normally consider a petition that you could put a lot of weight behind without knowing more about it. Okay, Councillor Moffat, you have a comment? Yeah, I, uh, I've i been in conversation with Jennifer a number of times and a few others that are on this list. And uh, I suggested that they, if they want to make it of more weight, just sort of to uh, Craig's point, is that they needed to knock door to door in the area. Um, obviously, uh, COVID-19 kind of, you know, put that on a bit of a back burner or sidetrack. 
Um, but I think the concern is, is, is really the location and the impact going forward. So I think it's got validity in terms of, you know, it's the same comments that we made earlier today. We need to, you know, find out what our residents are saying, especially now that we're going to move forward with the tower in Humphrey is because we don't, the idea is not to, the idea is not to upset the residents if we're going to move forward with a strategy on broadband. So I think we, we need to balance this and take it into consideration as we move forward with, uh, with Vianet. That's, you know, and I, and I think we should, you know, not put it on the back burner, but just take it into consideration. Yeah, and I think, I think we need to keep the consumer and our ratepayers informed about when the public consultation will happen and all of that kind of stuff. And yeah. I've seen what Vianette did in Carling, and, and it was pretty robust, but I think we can encourage them to do even more. Yeah, I think dialogue and the communication is going to be important no matter what we do, whether it's, you know, at this spot or wherever we go across the township. It's nothing else that we've not found about OP or, you know, short-term cottage rental. Those are critical yeah. pieces that we need to make sure we have a dialogue. Thanks. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, and just to add one thing, I did speak with Ms. Elves quite some time ago when they were talking about this. Um, and I did ask them and advise them, remember the public consultation is done by the proponents and they yeah. should be all, they should be submitting this to the as their comments to the proponents. So I advise them just submitting it to council is not not really meeting what the requirements of that public consultation put out by uh, the federal government is. So it's fine to have this to council, but hopefully they still submitted their comments in the proposal. Uh, the just to, sorry, Craig, just to address that, my understanding is that they, they did both, but what they wanted to make sure that council was aware, just in case something, you know, missed the table. They wanted just to make sure that the council did see that there was some concerns with the location, but I believe they did both. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Item H, Councillor Osborne. Yeah, uh, sorry. Mayor. sorry. I just wanted to draw draw attention draw. to the responsibilities of our township. That would include council. I'm, I'm not, this is not a shot at staff. Um, during these opening and shut times with COVID and all the confusion over it, rumors seemed to resound pretty quickly. And there was all kinds of pressure on us to get washrooms open and also. And um, I, I hear from one counselor that the washrooms in Ross are open. And then uh, who he said, he mentioned, he heard it from the mayor. Then I call the staff and I find out, no, they're not open. And I, I keep getting mixed messages between what counselors are saying and what staff is saying, and there seems to be hesitancy as to make decisions at staff levels. And in speaking with some staff, the, the comment was, well, we don't have the staff to manage the washrooms at this point. And because they're busy doing other things like grass cutting and weeding gardens and things like that, which I found I thought wasn't as important as maybe the washroom issue was. Um, so then I was told that the new washroom in Rosso at the hall was open and just only to find out the next day that it was not open because the water supply wasn't there. So, and then I'm told that we couldn't hire students. So a lot of these things can't get done. But then I'm told that again from someone else that yes, we did hire students. So I keep getting mixed messages. So I think we we need to all be on the same sheet and everyone in all the directors should be keeping council informed on public issues when they can so that we're all on the same sheet. And when we get questioned by ratepayers, we have a valid answer. I guess that's my point. I, I I agree we should all be on the same page. I will, I'm gonna ask Michelle to address it, but the, the voice of staff, when things get done, opening and closing is the CAO, and as soon as it was determined uh, on that Friday afternoon, you all received a memo um, about it, and I'll ask her to update you a little bit, but that's the voice of staff. But when I got the memo, the washroom at the hall was still not open. No, no, it can't be. No, 
When we reopened the washrooms, the two washrooms that were opened were the ones down at the waterfront in Rosso and the ones at Foley Matheson. The new washroom at the hall actually requires water to be delivered. So you, we couldn't open it immediately. We also needed to contact our supplier to be able to get the porta potty placed. So the only washrooms that were opened on that Friday afternoon were the ones at the waterfront. I believe that the hall washroom, the new one, was opened on the Tuesday after that. And the porta potties were being delivered by the end of that week. So that's where we stand with those. Well, thanks for that information, Michelle, because I didn't know about that until just now. Thank you. Again, if you have any questions about any of the things that are opening, please give me a call um, because generally I have a pretty good idea of what yep. we're doing. Yep. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item is item H, which Councillor Osborne has already spoken to a little bit, and the addendum package has his letter or his email to uh, Jeremy. Um, Rod, I'm assuming you will follow up um, to find out when the next meeting is and how we can maybe mend some bridges with the OPP. And it's not just Jeremy, it's whoever Jeremy's boss is, because it was Jeremy's There, there will not be another meeting until the new OPP headquarters is open, which likely isn't going to be till late fall or winter. However, I guess we need to know how we communicate with CPAC, whether or not there is a meeting. Who do we call? What well, do we I suggested do? I suggested Zoom to Jeremy, but he said it's not secure enough. OPP won't use it. But there are other alternatives they could use. Where, where there's a will, there's a way. They don't seem to be interested in ha handling any meetings this year until COVID okay, goes on. I'm, I'm asking for how we communicate with CPAC when it's not in a meeting. Who do we call with a question? Uh, well, the commander right now is Jeremy. He's being replaced, I believe, in August by a lady from Marilia. So it's kind of in flux right now. Okay. I will at least. I'll play a, play a call to Jeremy to kind of move some feathers here. Um, and item I, um, who's going to speak to this about the, the off-road? Okay. Um, I think this is important. I'm going to ask the clerk... Um, to draw your attention to this um, new um, Highway Traffic Act, I guess it is, amendment, uh, and give you a little background on what we might need to do. As of July 1st, the MTO has amended the Off-Road Vehicles Act and added some new types of off-road vehicles. So council should uh, review this so that you get a better understanding of what is and what is not permitted anymore by the MTO. This affects municipality because the municipality has a bylaw that allows uh, off-road vehicles on municipal roads as previously defined under the Off-Road Vehicles Act. So I would suggest maybe council direct this back to staff to look at and review and come back to council with a report on what our current bylaw says, what the difference would be and what been amended in the municipal or the provincial legislation and go from there. Okay. Councillor Moffat, you have questions. Uh, no, I don't have a question. My my read of it is that we needed to change bylaw 076 as a result of the change. So I'm I'm I would say that agreeing with Craig that as council I we believe I believe we need to direct staff to do a review and make sure it's current with the with the new changes. And I would put that motion forward if we need to. I don't think we need a resolution, do we? Can this be a direction to staff on this one? Yeah, yes. Keep in mind that the stuff from Mr. Bell Chamber is not law. No, it's, it's council it's choice. Yeah. Okay. I know. So, um, I know. I was. I, I know. I'll can that over to you, Michelle, because I'm not sure where this belongs for staff report. Well, it, it'll it'll be in the action list. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and next is council reports, but I'm going to suggest that we first go to the CAO council or her report because I think she might preempt some of the questions coming out of councillors. And her report appears on page 276. 
<sighs> go ahead. So, there we go. Um, it's been a busy few weeks. Uh, I attended the airport commission meeting. It's the first time we've ever had a meeting in a hangar. Um, <laughs> but it was done socially distancing, and it, we got a lot of work done. Uh, I attended the special meeting of council regarding the patio extension. As I mentioned before, we reopened the washrooms at the waterfront in Foley Matheson, and I believe the washrooms at the hall are now opened and the porta potties are being placed. Uh, we've been working with the market and various businesses in Rosso to get the seasonal garbage bins placed. Um, that's becoming a little bit of an issue now that we have more people in the area. Um, as of a week ago Sunday, Peter added 10 to 4 at the landfill and he should be moving to full summer hours, which is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 8 to 4, um, starting on Wednesday, um, which I think is going to make a lot of people happy. The community service staff are getting the halls up and running outside of the ice surface um, because we do have some rentals that will be starting in August. Uh, with respect to Turtle Lake Road, the gravel should be done by now. Um, they're getting ready for the next stages, which are asphalt and surface treatment. And Peter has advised that they're starting, amazingly enough, the winter sand operations at our township pit. So, thank you. We've been busy. Councillor Osborne, do you have a question for the CAO? Uh, no. Okay, you've got a little blue hand up. Oh, sorry. Oh. Okay, Councillor Finson, how about you start with council reports? Hi. Um, well, um, I missed a DSAP meeting last week. I forgot all about it. I had a really bad headache and I was very embarrassed. I've never missed a meeting in my life. Anyway, it was very embarrassing, so I didn't get to that meeting. I did read the reports, though. Um, I had a lot of phone calls, a lot of conversations around, you know, what can people do? What can they not do? Some complaints, uh, uh, which I've directed to the township if they choose to make an official complaint. Other than that, not a whole lot going on. Just uh, yeah, nothing else. Thank you. Councillor Collins, Ward 5. Yes, Mayor, thank you. Yes, I, uh, in fact, I did uh, make uh, the uh, DSAB meeting on the 9th, and it was just a regular meeting. Uh, in fact, it was over early in just, just under 30 minutes. So uh, nice. other than that, I've uh, had a lot of calls uh, uh, about our land, uh, about our landfill site and the lineup and people waiting and so on and so forth, and I'm really happy to see that that extra day on Sunday uh, that uh, is working fine and it's working to uh, alleviate a lot of the um, uh, uh, the waiting that uh, residents are going through. And uh, with that Sunday opening. It's, it's good for the contractors, too, who start work on the Monday. So uh, kudos to, uh, uh, to uh, the uh, roads department for opening that. I'd like to see it another day open and uh, get back to our summer uh, time rather than uh, uh, just four, uh, four days because summer is five, five days a week. It should be open. Everybody's up now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Feller. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yes, we had a committee of adjustment uh, meeting. Uh, went well, two applications. Um, and I'm looking forward to my first uh, park to park meeting later on this week. I've been, been informed. You know, uh, so we'll see what happens. And uh, 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 yeah, that's about all I have to report. Okay, Councillor Osborne. Uh, yes, Mayor. Just a question on our meeting schedule. Our next meeting, I suppose, is uh, August. August 4th, I believe. Yeah, now that we're into stage three, does that mean we're going to convene in person again? Because I, I think you can have, what, 50 people? Um, we voted last uh, council meeting to continue the Zoom meeting. Um, if you okay. want to reintroduce that motion, 
we can do that, but um, we council voted to continue Zoom until at least the end of the summer. Oh, till the end of August then. Okay. At least. All right. Thank you. I've had some requiries uh, from ratepayers, that's why I asked. So. Well, with the Zoom, they will be able to watch on YouTube. Because everybody knows uh, what day's three now. So. Councillor Collins, or sorry, Councillor Coles. Thanks. Um, yes, the, the mayor and Daryl and I attended the uh, like Ratepayers Association meeting on uh, Sunday morning. At a really well organized meeting. I got to tell you, the level of professionalism they have on their board now is uh, startling and, and quite amazing. You're laughing, Jeff. Do you think that's true? It's very good. What does that say about you and I, Art? Because we're Not on much. the board. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at <laughs> that. Why is Carrie there? Remember? <laughs> anyway, sorry. That's that's a an aside. Um, a great meeting, and they, they had a wonderful way of polling the audience to get get results, which I, I was quite impressed with. Um, I had, I've had a lot of calls from people about gypsy moth, and it, you, we've all noticed that there's gypsy moth everywhere, uh, the moths, but the problem is when the moths are out, you can't do anything about it. You have to get them when the worms are there or wait until the spring when their eggs are on the trees. So anyway. Yeah, that's a... um, Belvedere, uh, we had a, we've had a, a bunch of things going on there. In fact, uh, you knew that we did have two cases of COVID with uh, in staff at Belvedere, which are now resolved, and we're out of the woods on that. No more cases, and there was no residents affected whatsoever. That's good news. Um, I, I got to reinforce again how happy we are with the fact that we're participating with the West Perry Sound Health Center in managing. Uh, Belvedere. It's their staff person that's under contract and we hope to go further. It's made a huge difference in the inspection reports we get back from the province and uh, all of that. So it, it's uh, we're going ahead and hopefully it's going to save us money. That's, that's really what we're looking for. The Chamber of Commerce we met as well last week. The Chamber is, it, because of COVID and the business, uh, the effects on business, they're asking their members now to produce profiles and send them to them and they will profile the business on their, whether it's through Facebook, uh, Instagram, they'll promote, well, it's not really promotion, profile them uh, through the digital media wherever they can. So this is an opportunity for businesses that are members to get another, just a leg up and a little more promotion in terms of uh, hopefully helping out. Um, <clears throat> I don't know whether I had anything else. I think that's pretty much, oh, I, I and I, I also, I, I said this before, but I want to say this again. I, uh, Steve's still here, I think. I, I got to tell you, I, I'm so impressed with Steve and his ability to resolve issues. Steve's done. Okay, just very impressed. With <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Yep. I know you're instrumental and in doing some of the things that you that I've seen you do recently and uh, we're on the keep doing it. Well, I'm always at your service. So if you want me to get involved to help help uh, repairs out, I'll be there for you. Just you just get the rest of your staff to do the same thing. Yeah, I, I hear you. I, I think our next meetings, we're gonna bring, bring this to light and uh, make some changes, positive Thank changes. You. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Um, that it? Okay, Councilor Moffitt. Yes. Yes. All right, so uh, I attended the uh, Safe Quiet Lakes uh, voting webinar last week. It was uh, also very well done, very well organized. Um, and uh, it was a bit of a, they showed a, uh, I think it was in Port Carling, which was a bit of a scary situation in terms of canoers, kayakers, speedboats, everything. And, and on the Otter Lake uh, Ratepayers Association meeting on Sunday, they, they referenced that um, sort of that dangerous Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon kind of uh, situation. So um, spending a lot of time on uh, ice cap, uh, the climate change action, we've, uh, we did an interview um, with uh, 
University of Guelph last week. They're doing a research paper on uh, the collaboration and uh, you know what it's what it's doing and how did it sort of form and everything else. And there's more news coming with uh, with regards to ice cap in terms of uh, we've reached out to the all the members, municipalities, and staff to uh, do a big push to get the carbon calculator out. And Anne had raised that uh, yesterday in the meeting, so. We're scheduled for hopefully either later this week or early next week to do a, a, a blitz, let's say, through uh, through all the townships and everything else. So uh, we are interviewing. Um, I have another interview with the North Star tomorrow with Stephanie Johnson on the same topic. Um, attended with uh, Councillor Finson and the Mayor McDermott, uh, the OP meeting earlier today, which I thought was uh, quite a lot of dialogue and, and uh I didn't think we'd get done in the two hours. It, uh, things kind of move fast. Um, received a number of calls on uh, the OP, on waste, on short-term rentals, on roadworks, and on Gypsy Moss. And with respect to Gypsy Moss, um, there is an upcoming uh, webinar that's being put on by the Federation of Ontario Cottagers Association. I've also received some information from some residents. What I'd like to do is is collect it all and um, get it over to staff so that maybe we can put that information on our website, some social media, some information for residents to education to see about, uh, you know, at least getting informed and, and some ideas as to how to deal with them. So I'm gonna, I've talked to Craig already and I've hopefully we'll put that on the agenda. If it's not on the agenda, then just as a, as a way to distribute information more broadly. Oh, what do you have there, Art? You're on mute. There's the government of Canada has a, it's, you can Google it, a thing on Gypsy Moss, what they are, how to, how to deal with them. It's, it's a really good article. Nature. It's very, two pages, for sure. Yeah, and I, I think something like that, I think given that we've, you know, it's just a matter of education of the residents and, and let them decide how to, how to best manage, you know, the situation. Just, to, it's a matter of getting informa information out. So that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you. I think most of what I was involved in has been brought up. The airport commission in a hangar um, was actually probably a good thing for us to see what the inside of a hangar really looks like. Then on July 8th, um, Art and I attended the regional broadband meeting, and I do say it was we're going to need a, a, a Zoom manager because now we're up into the 20s and 30s of attendees of municipalities. And the, mo the in principle resolution we passed today is going to all of East Perry Sound and everything else. And today I did get a reply from three of the First Nations that weren't able to attend. That, that's good. Um, and then I was at the special meeting of um, council for the restaurants. And I just want to point out that what we passed, the policies for all were for all of the restaurants in uh, see one. They were not just for crossroads, and so I think that was very important. That special meeting uh, delineated between uh, those that were expanding their patio on their own property and those that were expanding their property on municipal property. But the policies passed were for the entire township. Uh, and again, yesterday's Otter Lake Ratepayers Association was really well run especially since the um, chair of the meeting lost her power. Uh, we were right in the middle of the thunderstorm and the downpour, and she was back up with her generator in a matter of minutes. Several of us got kicked out and back in, so it was, it was a real good test of rural internet. Um, and then this morning's OP steering committee, I think we got a lot covered, I just hope that we can get more of the public input coming in. It, it hasn't been very robust yet. And I think a lot of it, it's certainly on the website and stuff, but I think a lot of it is gonna depend on us and our steering committee talking it up person to person. So please do that. Um, and the consultant has agreed to try and break it down by topics a little better than just saying, oh, read the official plan, because nobody's gonna do that. It's boring reading and it's Councillor Simpson pointed this out. Nobody's going to sit down and read the official plan. They have to have the areas highlighted that they might be interested in. 
and overall, I, I know that staff is incredibly busy right now in building and planning, and I want to just play, say hats off to them for keeping everything kind of calm, cool, and, and collective. Um, I, I know we want to do the confirming bylaw and get out of here. The one thing I want to draw your attention to, particularly you, Rod, is um, in correspondence number T, uh, they're asking for um, the uh, input from the township on the you know, OPP uh, governance model. And um, so I really um, think that because you're the CPAC representative, they asked for it today. That's obviously not going to happen. But if you could put something together uh, and circulate it to um, the councillors before it goes uh, into uh, the Attorney General, I'd appreciate your perspective on it. So that'll go. Is that okay, Councillor Osborne? Yep. Yep. Okay. Do what I can, but it's very, it's it's pretty vague right now. There's yeah, still, you might talk. Right, reach out to some of the other municipalities if you want. Yeah, they're they're, they're still looking at the process on how they're going to rearrange this whole thing. But it's an imp it's a chance for input, so. Yep. Okay, I have a motion that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Seguin does hereby receive the correspondence as presented on the agenda and the addendum for July 20th, 2020 meeting of Council. Could I have a motion from Ted Collins? <coughs> I so move. Gail, can you? I second. I second. Thank you. <laughs> I have a motion that bylaw number 2020-067 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of meetings of council is hereby deemed to be read a first, second, and third time and passed by council. Can I have a motion from Daryl? I so move. Seconded by Art Cole. I'll second. All in favor? Thank you. Two more, I think. Uh, that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Seguin does hereby adjourn this regular meeting of Council at 9.04 p.m. to meet again on Tuesday, August 4th, or at the call of the Mayor. Could I have a motion from uh, Councillor Osborne? So moved. And seconded by Count Terry Fellner. Uh, seconded. All in favor? Aye. Thank Aye. you. It doesn't seem to matter what time we start, we always stop at night. Five and a half hours. Thank you right. very much, everybody. Right now.